Good morning. Uh, Mr. Sir Kumar, our resource person, and uh, Mrs. Gotakande, Director of College of Banking and Finance, and Mr. Menaka, uh, the coordinator, and also uh, the most valuable team, our uh, participants. Uh, I, I consider it as a privilege to introduce our resource person today, and uh, as well as the program to this uh, professional audience. Before that, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, Mr. Sirikumara, I, I would like to share a few thoughts that are related to my experience recently, because uh, we offer a legal uh, course for under our uh, programs also, and there are most of the lecturers, most of the lecturers of the, were of the view that the students seems to prepare only for the earlier read questions and set answers without having a clear understanding about the importance of legal environment uh, for their day-to-day -day professional duties. Therefore, we had to conduct a special program, special program uh, to educate them about that. So I think uh, legal, now legal environment is uh, common for everything because uh, the life as well as our economic activities are like a game game has to have a set of rules. If there are no rules, then uh, each, every, each and every individual work according to their own interest, which may not be conducive for the entire society, and also its sustainability. That's why we need uh, the law and also legal environment and also implementation of that. Uh, I think uh, with that, I would like to introduce this program. I think uh, when we look at the program, it covers everything, the common law and also uh, the law related to operations of the banking system and also the products, payment and settlement system and also money laundering. Uh, so it covers entire entirety of it. It will be the responsibility of our participants. Uh, as always, we have the spirit of recognizing our participants as the future leaders of the banking system. Uh, therefore, with that uh, respect, we introduce all these programs and also uh, conduct programs. Uh, let me introduce our resource person. Uh, Mr. Sirikumara is uh, one of our very good friends and also he has been a very long-term resource person for the IBSL programs and also uh, in other organizations like Law College and all those. And uh, I first, I have to appreciate uh, very much uh, for his coming, uh, accepting to conduct this program with his very, very uh, busy schedule as the director of uh, legal department of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the regulator. You can understand how busy he is, especially in an environment like today, where there are so many turbulent situations in the economy and also the financial system. Therefore, uh, uh, then he is the correct person, actually, the most suitable person to start this program and also to continue with that. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, with his busy schedule, uh, we have to get his maximum out of uh, whenever he conducts the lectures. With that, let me, let me formally introduce Mr. Sirikumara. He has a degree from uh, University of Colombo and also a master's degree from, again, the University of Colombo, and also a master of degree from uh, Monash University, and now uh, these days he is feeding for his PhD. Um, and his professional qualifications, if you look at his professional qualifications, uh, he is attorney at law, uh, and also he has earned honors at his final exam. Uh, he has uh, international diploma in compliance, international diploma in anti-money laundering, and member of International Compliance Association. Uh, and with that academic and professional qualification and also his position as the director of financial, this uh, legal department in the central bank, we can understand how resourceful he is. So it will be the responsibility of our participants to get the maximum out of uh, uh, the engagement that you are going to have in this program with him. And finally, take a certificate along with the clear understanding about the legal environment and also the sense, uh, sense uh, legal sense that we have to have 
in uh, attending to our daily life as well as the professional life with that sir uh, mr sir kumar let me uh, hand over the program to you uh, and also again i have to say it is a very uh, pleasant uh, situation of seeing you after a long time thank you sir thank you thank you mr kalatra thank you very much for inviting me and also i would like to share a few thoughts in your presence as well uh, i mean uh, before i start the formal lecture as you said uh, mr kalatra and uh, i must uh, appreciate uh, mrs uh, godakanth's invitation as well and menaka's assistance as usual for last uh, at least 15 years uh, throughout the, this period i have been closely associated with the institute uh, all this time you have been very helpful to me uh, very very resourceful in in assisting us uh, as of this program on law uh, i think what mr karathrak said is very relevant uh, very often i we see that certificate and at uh, at uh, ibsl ordinary courses people uh, students get ready for those exams just studying for few selected questions but the reality is that uh, if i'm to use a use a maxim very often we use latin in uh, teaching and learning law there is a maxim which goes as ignorantia justa non excusa i think you would get the idea since it is very very when you consider the familiarity with english what it means is ignorance of the law is not an excuse on the other hand ignorantia facta excusa i facts uh, ignorance of facts may be an excuse but ignorance of law is not an excuse that is the situation in almost all the countries so in sri lanka as well that is the case so it is useful for anyone to learn something about law especially when you are going into a kind of a complex environment like banking and finance it is very likely that your ignorance might result in unnecessary kind of resource that might entail a very serious uh, uh, repercussions for that reason i think uh, even if we for totally forget about the certificate and the qualification that you are getting uh, knowing something about your day to day business is very much important also uh, what i have heard from many lawyers who are in practice and uh, working in say, various institutions is that sometimes they tend to make mistakes thinking that certain concepts of ordinary laws are equally applicable in bank customer relationship and banking and therefore they think that this is an ordinary contract no there are a lot of things that have been introduced especially throughout the world after different lessons they have learned uh, it may be great depression in 1930s it may be global financial crisis in Uh, 2007 onwards they have learned different lessons and shaped their financial regulatory environment to suit to meet those challenging situations now in sri lanka we would see uh, while we go on in the course that there are a lot of changes like that those are happening on day to day basis now who thought uh, maybe 2 years ago that we are would be in a situation like this today that we would be teaching online that we would be not going to office uh, on a daily basis and working from home and who thought that our contracts with customers uh, would be considered in a different way you may have heard of the uh, coronavirus 19 uh, act that recently came into effect this kind of things are i mean banking sector environment banking and financial environment is changing daily basis Uh, the limits between certain activities in the banking business are getting blurred very rapidly new things are coming in certain uh, unnecessary things are going out so it is always advisable for anyone to keep abreast with the developments in the sector maybe it's low or otherwise but we need to know about the, all those things Uh, classical english law and banking was developed in, over a long period of time but that would not capture very recent development including developments in ict and so on so in our uh, discussions uh, from today onwards we would cover all these things and basically 
apart from the qualification, uh, we would be in a position to be ready with the challenges, with more kind of, uh, we can, we should be in a position to arrive at decision in a more uh, kind of an educated basis, knowing what is the law applicable, knowing the risks in certain areas. Uh, that is my idea of uh, um, uh, agreeing to, I mean, uh, what, what, that is what I'm uh, proposing to contribute in this course, uh, Mr. Kamathilaka and Mrs. Uh, Gurukanda. Uh, so from this point onwards, then I'll speak to the participants. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Hello, uh, welcome everyone to this program on uh, banking and finance, ba banking and finance related laws. Uh, in this program, as I mentioned, that uh, I would be, uh, I would endeavor to cover uh, several areas that would have been given in the brochure given to you. Uh, in addition, we would be covering anything that you would uh, think relevant. Uh, I mean, if you pose any question on any area related to banking and finance, I would give my uh, fullest, I mean, I, I, on a best effort basis, I will try to uh, give you a clear understanding about what it is. That doesn't mean that uh, I know everything about banking and finance. My knowledge is always, as I consider it, is very limited. Uh, to certain areas sometimes and and sometimes i may not be the best person to uh, get the most recent knowledge about those things but as a keen student in these areas always i have been uh, following up developments i have been uh, working with uh, industry uh, regulator as well as the entities those are framing laws in this area so i think i can do a fairly good job in in uh, giving certain insights as to any area in banking and finance. Uh, before I go into specific details of the program and start today's session, I would like to uh, just share some information and I would like you to share your background as well. Uh, as Mr. Karnathirka mentioned, I'm a lawyer by profession and my academic qualifications are, uh, you may have heard that uh, first degree, then master's degree, again master's degree, uh, the professional qualifications, everything is something in law or something related to law. Uh, apart from that, I have done, uh, I have got some accountancy qualifications uh, earlier, in the very earlier stages of my career, even before joining the Central Bank uh, from Chartered Institute. Uh, but I'm mostly engaged in law and law related areas. In the Central Bank, uh, my basic areas are uh, basically advice in the central bank on uh, legal issues, legal and policy issues, and ensuring compliance uh, in the central bank to different national and international requirements pertaining to uh, central banking and banking, as well as investments in uh, local and foreign markets. Uh, also, I'm responsible for handling litigation uh, for the central bank, uh, handling litigation in the sense that I'm supposed to uh, basically assert and defend rights of the central bank in courts and other legal fora. And uh, glad to say that uh, for last uh, 16 years at least from 2005 onwards, I have a very clean record of not, lo not losing even a single case. So these are things that I'm proud of and I'm very closely engaged in uh, law reforms. For the time being, for, at the moment, I'm handling 18 different law reforms, 10 very closely connected to central bank and eight other things which are relevant to relevant in a different way uh, to the banking and financial sector. Uh, apart from that, probably you may have heard that there is a very uh, ambitious capital market development project going on in the country. Uh, in that area, again, I'm supposed to be, uh, there are 23 sub areas uh, in that project. Uh, I'm supposed to be leading 18 of those 23. 
so you would see that I'm engaged in this area and I would be in a position to uh, contribute at least reasonably question certain practices and certain uh, the kind of thing how things are going on in banking and financial institutions uh, with that i would like uh, each of you to give a b brief discussion uh, description about yourself uh, the reason being that i need to know to what extent i should be talking and to what extent i should be explaining things and so on so i would like to go on uh, ask you uh, to start uh, probably since no one would be uh, coming forward in this uh, saturday morning as a volunteer i would like to go by these numbers uh, i think number one here is uh, dilumi is dilumi there Hello. Uh, you can see the names. Is Dilumi there? In that case, uh, Hashan. Is Hashan there? Then uh, number three. Uh, Chamini Hello Hello yeah uh, good morning okay. sir Yeah is this Dilumi or uh, Chamini Dilumi uh, this is Chamini Yeah Chamini please go ahead Yeah uh, I'm Chamini Drisinghe and uh, working as a banker for last 10 plus years in yeah. uh, uh, with two international banks and uh, currently I'm working as assistant manager at HSBC and I'm a fresh MBA holder. Uh, yeah. Also, I have a, a graduate diploma in bank, uh, banking and finance uh, with uh, University of Pearson UK. Um, yes, uh, I just wanted to, um, because I have a passion uh, with the um, um, uh, uh, legal side of the banking aspects and uh, all the regulatory requirements and uh, currently um, um, currently my job uh, role is not uh, related to the uh, field but I'm looking forward to uh, you know develop my um, knowledge and everything about this area so that's why I want to join the class thank you so much yeah thank you thank you Jamini uh, is uh, I think Dilumi is raising hand is the, uh, are you ready uh, available Dilumi Probably she wants to convey a message. Probably her mic may not be working or something. Uh, then uh, number four and and Prabhati Disanayaka. Hello, are there? Then uh, Madhushani. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I'm Asanti. I'm working for National Savings Bank for last five years. Uh, and I'm a bachelor's holder in Aquinas University College and an MBA holder from University of Northampton. Yeah. Uh, um, because I'm a banker, I would like to develop my knowledge in uh, the legal side of banking. And uh, because it is a day-to-day -day requirement of all of us, yeah. Uh, so uh, that is why I joined the class. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Then uh, next, uh, Dilukshi. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Good please. morning, sir. Uh, I'm Dilukshi Sankalpani, working at Commercial Bank. Uh, I'm working at Commercial Bank nearly three and a half years. Uh, yeah. Because I'm interested in legal aspects in banking, that's why I have applied for this course. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, then uh, is it Rasika or Rasika going by ID number Rasika? Rasika from HDFC. Are there? Okay. Uh, Dulanjali. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Dulanjali from Bank of Ceylon. Uh, yeah. I've been in the Bank of Ceylon for the last 11 years, and I, at uh, present, I'm working as a credit officer at the Hivel branch. So, so as you said, uh, not knowing the uh, law is uh, an excuse. So uh, I like to learn some uh, knowledge, uh, to get some knowledge about law. Uh, so that's why I joined this program to get this knowledge because as a credit officer, I know that uh, it's must to uh, know about some uh, law facts relating to the banking and loans uh, and credit, all the things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then Nwanti uh, Shanika. Nwanti Shanika. Okay, I think she is raising hand. I'll, I'll, I'll speak with them later. Uh, Gayani Devi Ka Besekaran. Okay, now next, uh, Sampat Dilshan. Sampat from HNB. Then uh, Nishara Vikram Singha. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yeah. I'm Nishara Vikram Singha. I'm working for Commercial Bank of Ceylon PLC for last nine plus years. So I'm currently attached to Imports Department. Uh, I'm just uh, interested in learning legal. That's why I joined this class. Right. Thank you. Uh, then uh, Lakshan Malik Hassan. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm attached to commercial bank, uh, Bambaludi branch, and I'd right. like to gain the knowledge about the legal areas in banking. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, Krishna Vijay Singha. Uh, yes, good morning, sir. Uh, I uh, am now attached to Kagi's bank in the capacity of manager financial crime compliance. Uh, I've been in to banking for about the last 50, little more than 15 years, out of which 12, more than 12 years in compliance. And since legal and compliance is kind of entwined, I felt it would be beneficial to have a background understanding of the legal aspects pertaining to banking as well. Uh, I got my master's from the University of Bedfordshire and also completed my diploma in banking and also diploma in compliance from the IBSF. Right, thank you. Then uh, we get uh, Sanduni Vijay Sikharaj here. Sanduni. Mm. Find it difficult to navigate. Uh, who is number 16? I got three names. Uh, I can't see them here for some reason. Number 16 uh, is Priya uh, Kantini uh, Visakan. Yes, I am. Good morning. I am from uh, People's Bank, uh, Regional Credit Unit, Jaffna. Uh, I got my MBA qualification through University of Jaffna and completed the DBA 13 years ago. Uh, I wish to refresh my knowledge in legal side and uh, I wish to acquire the new knowledge about legal aspects of Sri Lanka. So I joined this um, certificate program. Thank you. Right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then Tilanga Hansini from Central Bank. Let's see. Yes, good morning, sir. I'm Tilanga Guruji uh, from Central Bank, uh, working attached to the Payments and Settlements Department. Uh, I did both uh, bachelor's and master's uh, degree from the University of Chichabad in Apura. So since uh, my uh, daily operations uh, mainly relating to the operational work, especially on reserve management back office, so I think uh, to update my knowledge in legal aspects, especially relating to the banking, that's why I joined this course. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dilanga. Uh, then Amila Krishnath is Amila. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Amila. Uh, I am attached to Commercial Bank Pitakote. Uh, since I am attached to operations area, I think the legal to enhance my legal knowledge, I applied for the course. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your contribution. I think uh, there are several, uh, at least two others who raised hands to say something. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think their microphones are not working or something like that for some technical reason. They couldn't share their information. But I'll uh, start with this. Uh, what I saw is that, uh, as I expected, there is a very diverse uh, kind of an audience is here. Some work in, in uh, almost all working in banks, but I think at least there are two, three lawyers who are not working in banks uh, who couldn't join uh, who couldn't uh, share their description uh, and even in, when you are in when those who are in banking are from different kind of backgrounds and they are working in different areas for example some are into credit some are into trade finance i think uh, 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 dulanjali is into credit and then nishara is into uh, imports then uh, there are others who are in operations like Amila. Uh, likewise, their experience is different. Some have 11, 12, 13, 15, and nine plus years of experience in different areas. So I think this is a very diverse audience, which I like. So I can very easily relate uh, things from little bit of uh, past as well as very recent things. And also I think if you raise, raise questions, that is the extent to which this program is going to be successful. Generally, uh, I may be talking about different things. If with your questions, very likely that we can go into further new, uh, further areas, uh, or uh, I mean, additional depth into uh, certain areas and so on. That that is possible with your questioning. Uh, having said that, I would like to start today's presentation which is uh, on uh, bank customer relationship. Now, do you see the first slide of the presentation? Can someone please tell me? No, sir. Okay. Still, uh, you didn't share your screen. I see. Menaka, I find it a uh, little problematic. I'll, I'll try again. I think now I'm sure. All right. Yes, sir. Yes. Now it's okay. Right. Uh, as I told you, Menaka, I'm using Teams, yes, Zoom, sir. WebEx, and everything. This is the <laughs> first time that I'm doing presentation over Google. Uh, yes, sir. Anyway, uh, yeah. The, my presentation is on uh, bank customer relationship. Uh, now, you would see that this is, uh, on the face of it, is a very ordinary topic. Uh, 
bank customer relationship bank uh, customer goes to the bank and establishes the relationship as a uh, customer then he the bank acts the works as the bank and he acts as the customer is that's it but there are a lot of things uh, pertaining to bank customer relationship when you see that from a point of view, the uh, legal point of view, you can see a lot of uh, subtleties where certain uh, roles played by the bank might give different kind of uh, connotations in, when it comes to uh, legal question, question of law. Uh, now, before going into legal details, I would like to tell you that bank customer relationship is something that has experienced a lot of changes with time, with certain developments in the field. Uh, for example, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, if you take bank customer relationship in Sri Lanka, the banking environment in Sri Lanka, probably a uh, little more than 30 years ago, probably 40 years ago or so, uh, I think you may not be, no, no one in this audience would be remember what was there 40 years ago. But I can faintly remember certain things. Uh, banking environment was not this apparently uh, 40 years ago. Uh, there was this dominance by state banks in Sri Lanka, basically Bank of Ceylon and People's Bank. Even Bank of Ceylon was not known to many people outside the city areas, uh, People's Bank and NSP to some extent, it was there. Uh, if the bank customer relationship was such that you have a contract with the bank and you go there, deposit money and sometimes withdraw money. Uh, even for you to withdraw a small amount of money, it was a very cumbersome, very tedious process. I remember going to uh, People's Bank in my area those days with my parents. Mm, I vividly remember for one particular reason, the time we spent there, because when we went there and uh, we, if we want, when, when we wanted to withdraw money, uh, we first go there and then uh, we go do some process. I can't remember what it was. I think we are filling some forms and so on and uh, we are getting a token. I can vividly remember it was a kind of a bronze color token with a number. Uh, we need to keep that token until such time we are called to serve. Uh, very often the time that we spent uh, waiting was, I believe, I guess, it was something like uh, more than half an hour. So we used to go to the bank and get that first part done uh, and get the token and go to other places like post office and other places and then come back to the uh, bank and wait for some more, little more time and then we would, we would be called and so then we uh, get our money back or we do our transaction and we go home. Now you see technology has played a significant role in changing this. No longer we go to the bank. I think any of you, especially those who are in banking and finance, you have your own arrangement, that's a different thing. Even a, even a person in this age, um, I mean, uh, any, any other person in this age, will not go to the bank like that, that as you used to do 40 years ago. Now we all are, customers of banks, but physical contact with the bank is something that we are doing very rarely. We would do all our transactions online. Maximum we would uh, do by going to a bank. It's not that we are going into the bank branch, but we would go to the ATM and withdraw money. Everything else, uh, especially during the last two, uh, one and a half years, I think everyone, almost everyone, uh, basically change from the old fashioned bank into the present way of doing uh, banking uh, over the over, uh, internet platforms. Now, this change is not, uh, not something that happened overnight. This was happening over a period of time. Then you see that 
in Sri Lanka, that can set the environment change with the arrival of the private sector participants from 19, uh, especially from 1980s onwards. Before that, there were banks like HNB and um, Commercial Bank and so on. But but with uh, at the latter part of 1980s, there were certain significant changes with certain new banks coming in. And uh, now it's a very competitive business where there are a lot of things happening in the banking sector on a daily basis. Uh, very competitive business, very dynamic area. And also it's a very risky area. Uh, I'll explain the risk area later on when we go into details. But today I'll limit my presentation to bank customer relationship. And there is one other thing that I could not tell you at the very beginning that is uh, in view of the nature of my work, I kept someone else, kept one of my uh, officers in the Central Bank Legal Department ready to do a presentation today. Uh, uh, she is the one who prepared this presentation and sent it to me. I couldn't go through the slides again, uh, even for a single uh, time, uh, but I would go through. I'll, uh, what I want to tell you is that from next week onwards again, there will be someone who will be uh, prepared to cover up the session in case I'm not in a position to attend. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll see what is in the bank and customer relationship here. The main areas that I would like to discuss are given here. Those are basically the definitions of the terms bank and customer. Then we would go into general principles governing bank and customer relationship then customers duty to the banker, then bankers too have duties to its customers. Uh, the termination of bank customer relationship would be uh, naturally and logically the last part of the presentation that we are going to discuss. And uh, I would like you to ask as many questions as possible. That is the thing that I would really enjoy and that is how I think you would learn a lot of things. Uh, whenever you feel that you need to ask a question, please ask that question. Please raise your hand. I think I can facilitate it on this platform. You can send them those questions in writing or you can uh, verbally ask the question. Uh, when you go into the meaning of the word bank and customer first we would consider what a banker is now uh, this is a famous case anyone would take this case to explain what a banker is uh, especially in sri lanka's context and this is also quoted in uh, other countries as well now this is a case where uh, this bank called the bank of chetinan had its head office in Rangoon uh, and a branch office in Colombo. You know, Rangoon is a city, uh, I think, uh, capital of uh, uh, Burma, Myanmar, earlier called as Burma. Now the head office was there and branch office was in Colombo. Uh, in the course of their business, this Colombo branch of Bank of Chetinand credited uh, particular amount of money to its head office, which was described as an interest for a period of one year. It was described as an interest. When the Colombo branch was taxed on this amount, I don't know for, on what basis of tax, uh, I mean, what principle of tax applied in this particular moment, uh, they considered the, this bank, this bank branch was taxed on that particular remittance of money. Uh, the bank claimed a deduction saying that Karambu branch carried on banking business, business of banking, and was entitled to tax deduction under the income tax ordinance. Their position was that this is the payment for which they can uh, uh, ask for a deduction. They were entitled to a deduction. Then uh, the real nature of the operations was such that Colombo branch had been mainly carrying on business of lending money on promissory notes 
or on mortgage of immovable property and also the management of estates and houses owned by the bank in Sri Lanka. You would see that this bank branch had been mainly carrying on business of lending money on promissory notes. Anyone who would like to obtain loan would come to the bank and get money by giving a promissory note. That promissory note, note is for the it's a kind of a promise that they would return money. Right? Uh, or on mortgage of immobile property, as you are familiar with, one can mortgage their uh, kind of a block of land or the house and obtain a loan. And this bank was, this entity was engaged in management of estates and houses owned by the bank itself in Sri Lanka. Uh, this uh, statement shows that no checks, no checkbooks had been issued. There was no evidence that any monies in deposits could have been withdrawn by check, draft or order. Now, this bank this entity, you see that they have been carrying on certain businesses like lending money on promissory notes as well as on mortgage or immobile property. They were managing estates and so on, but there was no evidence that they were having deposits accounts which could have been withdrawn by check, draft or order. In other words, in today's context, what you would see, you would tell that they are, they has, this bank, this entity has not handled checking accounts or current accounts, right? Uh, that was the situation in Bank of Chetina. The bank argued, argued where? Argued in that tax matter. Bank's position was that they were not subject to that particular tax because they were a banking institution and banks are exempted from that particular thing. Wide interpretation should be given to the word bank. The argument was that bank, the term bank should be defined widely, not narrowly. And they said that it was not necessary to show that it carried on all the activities of a bank. That it was not necessary to show that they carried, out, carried on all the activities of a bank. In other words, the argument was that it was sufficient to show that they carried on certain activities of a banker. For example, in the previous slide, I told you that they were giving loans against promissory notes and against mortgages. Now, that is, a, that, they, that is an activity that you are carrying out today in your banks. Right? So what they argued was that we have showed you that we are carrying on certain activities like lending and they would have referred to managing estates and so on. I said that these are activities of a banker. We don't have to show that. We are doing all the activities of a banker. Uh, and they further argued that in order to constitute a bank, a company need not deal with checks. No matter whether we deal in checks or not, we are a bank. In, on, in other words, what they said was, we would show that we are carrying on certain activities as a banker, but not all activities. Essentially, we don't have to show that we were into checking accounts, we were into current accounts. That's not a requirement to be a bank. Remember, this is the argument of the bank. Right? Then comes the decision of the Supreme Court and the Privy Council. Supreme Court was the highest court in Sri Lanka at that time. And Privy Council was the court in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, since this was prior to uh, Sri Lanka's independence and Sri Lanka becoming a republic in 1972, the decision was, decision could be appealed to the, the Supreme Court decision would be appealed to the Privy Council in the UK. So in both the Supreme Court and the Privy Council, it was held that a wide interpretation should not be given to the word bank. Bank is a bank. You cannot expand, you cannot kind of enlarge the definition of a bank. Then what is bank? 
uh, the simple reference here is that the Colombo branch of bank could not be regarded as a bank in the way that the term was recognized in English common law. Uh, Sri Lankan Supreme Court also had basically the British judges in Sri Lanka Supreme Court, they were very familiar with the English law concepts and also English law was taken in, introduced into Sri Lanka by civil law ordinance in, uh, when, when the British came to Sri Lanka. So banking law was basically English law and uh, accordingly they decided that a banker has to be identified going by the definition of the English law for the term and the Colombo branch of this particular entity, Bank of Chetinan, was not a bank when you consider the opposition against the concept recognized in English common law. Now, English common law should have something to define this. What is English common law position on this? Right? Uh, to understand what is Indian uh, English common law, what is the English law on bank customer relationship and the def definition of banker? I would like to take another case, which is United Dominion Trust or UDT versus Kirkwood, right? which is a 1966 case. Now, this is a little bit of a complex transaction. You need to uh, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind very carefully. Look at this slide. UDT had lent money to some entity called Loan Cell Motors Limited and had taken several bills of exchange as security. Now, this entity called UDT has given some money, has given some money, has lent some money. So, UDT is the creditor, Loan Cell is the debtor and had taken several bills of exchange as security. Uh, these bills of exchange would have been certain, yeah, in the broad sense, they would have been bills of exchange. You would just think that it, those are signed checks, maybe undated checks as some people practice in certain parts of the business. They have given certain bills of exchange as security. So that in case loan sell motors don't pay, uh, UDT can rely on those bills of exchange and claim value on those sales. These bills had been endorsed by Kirkwood, a gentleman called Kirkwood, who was the MD of the Lawn Sale Motors. Now, who was the borrower? Lawn Sale Motors. The bills have been endorsed by someone called Kirkwood, who was the managing director of Lawn Sale Motors Limited. Now, the bills of exchange have been issued by uh, loan sale motors and endorsed by Mr. Kirkwood. Uh, this company that is uh, loan sale motors went bankrupt and UDT sued Kirkwood as the endorser of the bills. <coughs> you would know and then we would be uh, uh, studying that part uh, on a bill of exchange an endorser can be sued. So what United Dominion Trust did was they could not go against Lawn Sale Motors because they went bankrupt. Now there is one other recourse available to you, them. That recourse is to resort to the person who endorsed the bills, Kirkwood, who was the managing director of Lawn Sale. So rather than going against Lawn Sale Motors for the unpaid loan, UDT went against Kirkwood, who was the managing director of Lawn Sale Motors, which is bankrupt, but Kirkwood was the uh, endorser. So on that basis, they went against him. Uh, Kirkwood argued that this transaction was a money lending transaction. That's what we learned earlier. This was a money lending transaction. UDT gave a loan to uh, Lawn Sale Motors. And Kirkwood argued UDT had not been registered under the Money Lenders Act. Now UDT could have lending could have been lending money with the authority of the Money Lenders Act, but there was no registration for them. 
under the money lenders money lenders act therefore they could not have obtained the money uh, sorry uh, the, therefore they could not have given this loan to um, loan sell motors and even if loan sell motors went bankrupt they cannot sue on the bills because you have done something without authority if you have done something without authority how can you collect uh, money on that transaction now just imagine if i'll take a very simple example which anyone would understand uh, say there is a particular property owned by uh, a particular wealthy person for some reason he transfers his property to his minor child who is say 10 years old uh, this minor child wants to buy something say uh, something to play a bat or ball or something and one day he is asking money from the parents but parents don't give him money so he would think that i'm the owner of this entire house and land and everything i can sell so he asked someone who is I maybe a uh, bypass or someone who is on road uh, whether you can give me 100 rupees i'm ready to sell this house this is the owner of the house right he, who is going to sell the house for the 100 for 100 rupees to buy a bowl or something now that transaction may be entered into but you see that this is a trans transaction is transaction with the minor so that transaction is not valid the even if the uh, transaction doesn't take place i mean proper deeds and other things are not entered into uh, uh, the other party cannot sue the child because there was there was no uh, contracting capacity this argument is similar to that udt was not registered under money lenders act and therefore they couldn't have given a loan and obtained uh, bills of exchange and they can now sue on the bills of exchange that was argument see what is the argument of udt they said they were bona fide carrying on the business of banking bona fide is in good faith we were good faith bankers we were doing this business in good faith we didn't want to cheat anyone uh, therefore they were exempted from registering under the money lenders act. this money lenders act required anyone who is lending money to be registered under that law but bankers were an exemption we were exempted from registering so no matter whether we got registered under money lenders act or not we had the capacity to give loans we had the capacity capacity to lend money that was the argument of udt because we are a bank right now for this reason to go against the argument of kirkwood they need to prove that they have the authority to do banking business. So they say uh, the authority to do lending. So they say we are a bank. They were trying to prove that they were they were a bank. They say they had opened a number of current accounts for customers. You see, this is something that was absent in the case of uh, uh, Bank of Chetinad matter. They had opened a number of current accounts for customers. They had issued uh, checkbooks and had collected checks for customers. Issued checkbooks in the sense that they have issued checkbooks so that their customers can draw checks on them, UDT. And also, they collected checks for the customers, meaning that they were acting as collecting bank as well. In the first case, paying banker, then as the collecting bank as well. Right? meaning that any of their customers can deposit with them uh, checks given to them by some other persons drawing on their respective banks so what this entity was trying to say was that look here we were having current accounts we were giving checkbooks to customers so that they can draw checks and also we accepted checks from the customers who have been uh, given such checks by customers of other banks and they also said we were regarded and recognized bankers in London. Right? We, our reputation is such that we are bankers. We are, of course, bankers. Therefore, Kirkwood can't come up with the argument. That's their position. Uh, 
majority of the court held that UDT's reputation as a banker constituted it a banker. But it is not the reputation alone, the situation, how, what happened, what was, what were the operations there. Lord Denin, uh, this is a very famous, very celebrated judge in the English judiciary. Lord Denning said, main characteristics found in banks, he said, he, he gave these uh, points, they accept money and collect checks for their customers and place them to their credit. They honor checks or orders drawn on them by customers when presented for payment and debit their customers accordingly. Keep current accounts or something of that nature in their books in which the credits and debits are entered. You see that the, the, the ordinary current account in practice is recognized here. They accept money and collect checks for the customers. You can deposit money as well as you can deposit checks. You can give checks to the bank so that uh, they can be credited to the customer's account. And also, they honor checks or orders drawn on them by their customers. Say, if this entity uh, has a pool of customers and they have been given checkbooks, they can draw a check on the entity. So they, they that is the, the other part. Finally, Lord Denning says, keep current accounts or something of that nature in their books in which the credits and debits are entered. So basically, they are doing uh, kind of banking operations, especially and, and necessarily including check operations. So this is, these are the main characteristics uh, according to uh, Lord Denny. You would see that going by that defin this definition, it is correct that Bank of Chetina was co not considered as a bank because they were not handling checks at all, right? So in these circumstances, you would understand that for an entity to be a banker, it is essential that they need to handle current accounts, checking accounts. Without checking accounts, an entity is not recognized as a banker for in English common law. Uh, I would go into Sri Lanka's position as well and we would try to understand whether this term is recognized or, or uh, defined in Sri Lanka's legislation as well. Now, this first interpretation, which is found in the Bills of Exchange Ordinance, is not very, very helpful in, in solving this problem. Bank includes a body of persons, whether incorporated or not, who carry on business of banking. Incorporated or unincorporated body carrying on banking business is a bank. That's the definition it gives. So it doesn't define what banking business is. So to that extent, base of exchange definition is not going to help us to solve this problem. Now we go on to the next uh, quarter uh, provision from the Banking Act number 30 of 1988. This is not a definition, but if you look at carefully at section uh, 2 of the Banking Act, it shows that any company under the authority of a license issued by the monetary board with the approval of the minister. It is an entity, a company, it's a special reference here, under the authority of a license issued by the monetary board with the approval of the minister. When we go on, we might see certain other developments, but you, what is most important here is that what is a bank, what is banking business? Right? Now, uh, you will see that uh, Bills of Exchange Ordinance definition did not define banking business, but banking business is defined in Section 86 of the uh, Banking Act. What does it say? The business of receiving funds from the public through the acceptance of money deposits payable upon demand by check draft order or otherwise and the use of such funds either in whole or in part for advances, investments or any other operation either authorized by law or by 
customary banking practices. This is a bit of a lengthy definition of banking business. Now, I earlier told you that when we were going through the common law position in the UK, uh, in Bank of Chetinath case, as well as in uh, UDT case, what we saw was that an entity can be called a banker only if it is carrying on current accounts. Otherwise, it's not a banker. Now, just tell me, I would like let you speak now. Uh, would you find that common law position in this definition? What are the particular words uh, that gives an indication as to whether we accept that position or we do not accept that position in Sri Lanka's law? Any any special reference from this definition here? Sorry. Anything that you find? Can someone please tell me? Anyone? Uh, I need to name, and this is, uh, uh, I know it's a bit uncomfortable for someone um, um, to get someone to answer this kind of question when it, the lecture is done on uh, a remote basis. But is anyone uh, volunteering to uh, give some sort of an answer? The business of receiving funds from the public through the acceptance of money deposits payable upon demand by check, draft, order, or otherwise, and the use of such funds either in whole or in part of advance or advances investments. It goes on like that. Can anyone volunteer or can I nominate someone to volunteer? What is the word that shows that Sri Lanka also the recognizes that common law definition of banker or not i think this may be too simple for you but i want to have a proper uh, kind of a foundation for everyone to understand this anyone Shall I name a few of you so that you can come up with some uh, answer? Uh, I'll start with an experienced banker, Christina. Christina, any idea whether Sri Lanka recognizes that concept? Hello, hi there. Yes, sir. Here the definition speaks of uh, accepting instruments such as checks, drafts, or so, so those are usual things done by a bank and uh, payable instruments that are used. So, yes, to a certain yeah. degree. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, is that common law definition accepted here or not accepted? Accepted. Accepted here. Yes. You were there, you didn't pinpoint the particular part, but you were there, your answer was correct. Uh, you see that specifically the word here, the business of receiving funds from the public through the acceptance of money deposits. Yeah, money deposits can be payable on demand or otherwise. Here it says payable upon demand, payable upon demand. Let's see, by checks, draft, order or otherwise. Payable upon demand. What does it mean? Payable upon demand. These are demand deposits. You cannot give any other definition to, uh, I mean, uh, a current account is a demand deposits. Whenever the customer demands, you need to pay. Now, now you might ask me, 
whether this definition is so strong. I mean, uh, can we tell a savings account customer that your account is not a demand deposit, therefore we are not going to pay you today, come tomorrow or something like that. Can we even tell a fixed deposit holder that you are, uh, you, on your demand we can't give you money? It's not a demand deposit. Demand deposits are only current accounts. No, that practically, I mean, you can't say that someone that your fixed deposit is not a demand deposit and therefore, even though you need money, we can't give it now. You can't come up with that target. This is, you are doing business. That is one thing. Uh, that I, I could tell you, uh, you at the before, uh, very beginning. And I see that uh, you are you are experienced bankers. I, I have been uh, training a lot of compliance staff in different entities as well as other staff on compliance areas. Uh, especially uh, one particular bank, uh, Sampath Bank, uh, then compliance said that now uh, DGM told me those days is that whenever people, especially those from the regulator, talk to them about the legal requirements and the compliance requirements, they try to impose those compliance requirements and regulatory requirements without having any kind of concern about business requirements. Uh, and why they wanted me to speak to their staff was that I was always taking the business regulation kind of a mix as well as striking the proper balance always noting that bank assigned business you should be in business you you are not doing regulation you are not doing compliance or something like that you need to be in your business legally your business should be compliant but your first primary focus should be on business so you can't tell a customer that, uh, look here, you are different. We know the law. By law, you are not a de demand deposit holder, so you can't demand money. But you have to give him money. So this demand deposit may be little misleading in today's context. If you have money in your savings account, but still you can go to an ATM and withdraw then and there. You can go to walk into a bank branch and withdraw money. It is, I mean, if you uh, draw a check, probably, it takes much more time than withdrawing or uh, AT, withdrawing your savings account money or from with AT. So this definition is not practically serving any big purpose now. But even for regulatory purposes, demand deposits are always distinguished from other things. Now, uh, Uh, who is uh, from NSB Asanti? Asanti? Yes, sir. Are you in banking business? Yes, and sir. Uh, why? How? Are you handling current accounts? No. Then? Mm. What is going on? Now, there's someone, Rasika from HDFC. Would you talk earlier? Is Rasika there now? Right? Are you handling current accounts? No. Uh, who else? I, I, that's only names I uh, noticed from. Uh, um, noticed from. Uh, how can they. How can I describe them? So there's a problem, but you are. Uh, you joined a bank, right, or something? Now you are doing some bank. What is the problem? That problem is not a problem at all when it comes to statutory law. The reason being, this is the definition of bank customer, the banking business in the Banking Act under Section 86. To be a, to, for an entity to do banking business, you need to do. Uh, checking account business that is demand deposits current account should be there but this is the banking business definition but the banking act of sri lanka that is number 30 of 1988 while recognizing this category who are doing banking business within this meaning also recognizes another category called licensed specialized bank other category is called licensed specialized banks 
the entities who are doing this are called licensed commercial banks. That is why those who are working at HSBC or HNB or Cargill's Bank or People's Bank or Commercial Bank are called uh, commercial bankers. They are doing commercial banking. They are from licensed commercial banks, whereas uh, persons like Asante and Raskar who are working in other entities are representing licensed specialized banks. These are licensed specialized banks which are doing slightly different business than the business of banking business defined here. That particular business is also defined. If you look at section 76A of the Banking Act, you would see that their business is defined slightly differently. But there are main features. They are also accept accepting deposits. They are main doing everything other than certain other than, other than uh, maintaining current accounts. That's the only technical definition, theoretical definition. Technically, practically, there are uh, certain banks uh, prevented from handling certain foreign currency operations. Again, uh, I think uh, MSB is having authorized leadership. Uh, therefore, that is the rise. Uh, other than that, there is practically no difference. Practical difference is only difference is uh, they don't maintain current accounts, demand deposits, right? So now we described the position, English common law position in the UK as well as in Sri Lanka. Now, statutory position. Statutory position is that banking business is defined, but the banking act is not limited to licensed commercial banks, which is which are doing banking business in the real sense, but it recognizes uh, licensed specialized banks as a separate category uh, in the Banking Act. So all these entities which are represented here are in the wider meaning banking institutions except that of uh, uh, Tilanga which is a central bank. It's not a banking institution. Other than that all the other entities are uh, doing in banking business kind of not in the statutory sense, not in the definition of the uh, Banking Act, but their scope of operations are authorized by the Banking Act. They all are licensed by the central bank to be bankers. Now, this definition, this difference, distinction between two categories of bankers, banks, was something recognized in the Banking Act from 1995 onwards. You see that this act was originally uh, enacted in 1988. In 1995, there was an amendment. To, that is the amendment that recognizes the other category called uh, licensed specialized banks. But uh, Santi would tell you that in, uh, NSB has a very long history. It was established much earlier than what was the issue. It remained there as a statutory body, not only NSB. You see, BFCC it, in its original form was not a commercial bank. NDB in its original form, as established in 1979, was not a licensed commercial bank. Right? Now, uh, SMIB, uh, all these entities were not licensed commercial banks, but with the enactment of, with the introduction of the amendment in 1995, to the Banking Act, they were also recognized as another category of banks which are licensed by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Now in Sri Lanka, we have two categories, licensed commercial banks and licensed specialized banks. Right? That is how uh, the definition of a banker is now fits into Sri Lanka. In other words, the classical English definition of a banker is can be applied directly to licensed commercial banks operating in Sri Lanka. But that does not mean that others are doing some illegal business. Their business is equally legal because they are recognizing the same statute as a uh, uh, legal business and, and they are licensed by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. That is what the initial description of uh, the banker is. Any questions on this? Anyone having any question on this area? Yes.
is it so easy or I'm going into unnecessary details? I'm not sure. It's very difficult to get the proper feedback when you are doing a presentation online. But uh, I would like to receive your views so that I can adjust the rest accordingly. Any questions? Hello. Yeah. Hello. All good so far, sir. Thank you. Did someone ask anything? Yeah, please. Okay, okay. Um, right, then we go into the topic customer, definition of the term customer. You all refer to anyone who would come to your bank branches as a customer. There may be someone who has been with you for last 10, 15 years or more than that, you would call them a customer. Or else there may be someone who is coming to pay his utility bill, say the electricity bill or something like that. You again refer to him as a customer. There may be someone coming to obtain a loan. Yes, customer. A credit card holder, you call him a customer. right? Even if someone is not coming for anything else, uh, uh, any, any of those activities, if, even if someone is loitering in the uh, in a bank branch, you would call him a customer. That is how we use it in practical circumstances. We need to look at from a very legal point of view what a customer is. Now, I'm repeatedly telling you these practical examples, <coughs> practical usage of the terms uh, to show that law is not something absurd. I mean, law is there. Wherever necessary, you need to uh, uh, work according to the legal definition. But in practical, for practical purposes, you should not take law into account. I mean, I have seen that in, in many places I'm associated with in my workplace and in so many other places, there are people are very much I mean, obsessed with legal definitions and law and legal requirements and so on. Sometimes people wonder whether I don't know law in certain areas to that extent, I don't care. Now, certain things should be involved, only if essential. Otherwise, we should be freely moving on. Right? That, that is, I'm telling, giving you practical usage as well. Now, this judicial interpretation of the term customer is uh, given in uh, several English decisions. I'll take this case of Robinson versus Midland Bank Limited, where a customer was described as described, given reference to this, uh, there must be evidence to show that bank accepted the person as a customer and dealt with him on that footing. You see, it's a very wide definition. There must be evidence to show that bank accepted the person as a customer and dealt with him on that footing. Right? You recognize someone as a customer and on that understanding you continue with him. That is what is a customer means according to this definition. We might Come, up, come to this definition again, or this case again, and uh, then this case, Great Western Railway versus London, it's not London Country Bank, it should be London County Bank, C-O-U-N-T-Y, London County Bank, right? Great Western Railway versus London County Bank, where uh, the court said some sort of account is essential, mere encashment of checks will not make a person a customer. Some sort of account <coughs> is essential. Mere encashment of checks will not make a person a customer. There may be someone who is receiving checks drawn on your bank. Maybe cash checks. One of your customers is drawing checks, right? For his, the supplies he received or something and gives those uh, checks to some other person, person called X. X is uh, seen to be coming into your bank, your branch, for the last 10 years. Every morning he comes and gets a check in cash, but he's, he does not have an account with you. Is this person a uh, person customer? In the legal sense, no. Why? He is bringing a check drawn by one of your customers 
and get in your service to encash that check. But that does not make that person a customer. For him to be a customer, he need to have some sort of account. That is a requirement. How you see that? Unless you have an account, you are not a customer. That's what it says. Right? Uh, on that understanding, we go into certain other things. This is Robinson case, which we referred to earlier. It says the, pers the person should possess the authority to open an account. It's again a requirement. Without the authority, you cannot open an account. Right? Uh, to become a customer, duration of relationship is not essential. What does that mean? Now, I just now I gave you an example uh, of someone who has been coming to your bank, your branch for last 10 years to get a check in cash, checks in cash almost every day. But I told you that he is not a customer. The reason being that he doesn't have an account with you. So even if he has been associated with you for 10 years, 15 years or 25 years, that doesn't make him a customer. But moment he opens an account, he becomes a customer. They are, you can't say that he is not a customer because he opened an account some five, five minutes ago. No, not five minutes, even one second. The moment someone opens a customer, open, opens an account, he becomes a customer. So what this case says is, to become a customer, duration of relationship is not essential. It's not of essence, right? The moment someone opens an account, he's a customer. Now this person who has been coming to a bank for last 10 years to get someone else's checks in cash is not a customer. But this morning he thinks that I should also open an account. And he gets an open account. The moment he does that, he is a customer. On that point onwards, he becomes a customer. So duration is not something important. Uh, I'll go back to the other one. The person should possess the authority to open an account. What is that authority? Basically, contractual capacity should be there. Now, you can't open for anyone, any person. Uh, if someone has a contra has contractual capacity, then uh, you can open an account for that person. What can be the exceptions? Say someone uh, who is not having contractual capacity, a person of unsound mind, uh, an insane person, he cannot uh, enter into a contract uh, which is a, a legally valid contract. So you cannot open an account for an insane person. Similarly, a minor, you know, minors accounts are there, it, it's a totally different mechanism. Parents can open accounts for minors, that is a recognized way. But minors can't walk in and uh, get accounts open because they don't have the contractual capacity. That is why it says a person should possess the authority to open an account. Sorry, I'm again uh, pinpointing to Asanti. Uh, can minors come to your bank and open accounts? <coughs> Hello? Uh, there should be a guardian to open, but they can operate. No. I mean, they can deposit money. Yo, uh, in other words, uh, um, I'll promise that I'm, I'm not asking any more questions from Asanti. Uh, but uh, generally, is there any difference between your bank's mine accounts and other banks? Say now, someone who is um, say from uh, any other bank, say commercial bank or people's bank or BOC, may also have a minus account scheme. But is there any difference between their schemes and your scheme? Mm -hmm. There is something uh, you need to look at NSB Act to see, see that uh, it, it recognizes the ability of persons of a particular age to operate an account. What you said is correct. Probably for, for all practical purposes, they need to come and uh, come with the parent, a guardian and uh, open the account. But they have the capacity to operate the account. 
why customers of NSP has the capacity and not the same person in any other bank? That is because of the law. The statutory law, the bank in, uh, no, sorry, NSB Act has this particular provision in the law which enables a person of a particular age, even though he is a minor, to operate an account. Therefore, uh, I think NSB, not very recently, about some time back, I remember even before I joined the Central Bank in the year 2000, uh, there are certain advertisements, I don't know now, I can't, I don't get to see the advertisements these days. Uh, I, I remember the advertisements on TV and so on had this particular uh, kind of edge uh, to show that uh, even minors can op operate their accounts, which is something not available to, uh, not available from other banks. You see that while I'm giving general description of common law as well as statutory law, we'll see exceptions in certain laws. Now, likewise, I might tell you in deposit kind of the protection of deposits as well. There is no guarantee that banks will pay your money again, right? That uh, probably today itself I'll show you. But there is something uh, strange in the bank in uh, NSB Act, which says that uh, depositors are guaranteed by the government. Government of Sri Lanka agrees to repay the depositors of uh, uh, NSB. But that, it, that is because of a special law, right? Unless special laws are there, I'm telling you the exact the general position in my presentation, but that there can be exceptions like those. Uh, this is a very congested slide. What it says is a person must have some some sort of account, which I said earlier, in savings or a current account or similar relationship make it a customer, such as fixed or term deposit. Right? It can be a savings account, can be a can be a current account, savings account, or a fixed deposit. Whatever it is, you are a customer only if you have a have an account with the bank. Right? Um, what if you have you don't have a current account? You don't have a current account. You don't have a savings account. You don't have a fixed deposit with a particular bank, but you have a credit card. Are you a customer? You see that in savings accounts, current accounts and fixed deposits, you have a balance with the bank. In the case of a credit card, normally you owe some money to the bank. So with that, can you become a, a customer of a bank? Merely because you have a credit card. Without taking your time, I'll give you the uh, answer as well. Uh, if I can remember Ellinger's uh, banking law, recognized, I think it was in 2007, 8 or something like that kind of edition, sometime back, uh, that even with a credit card, someone can become a customer. He does not have any positive balances with, with you, but a credit card uh, holder is a customer. Right? That is supposed to be another account, right? Uh, that's the position. A person becomes a customer of a bank immediately after he opens an account with the bank, even though he may never operate on the account. Uh, someone walks in and op op opens an account, he goes out. After for two, three, four, five years, he is not coming. Still, he is a customer because he has an account with you. There's one other point where his account can become dormant and so on. It can become abandoned property within the meaning of the bank. That it might have to be passed out. Those things are there. But he is a customer. He doesn't cease to be a customer just because he doesn't operate on the account. A bank cannot close a customer's account without reasonable notice to him. That is one thing. Uh, generally, a bank cannot close a customer's account without reasonable notices to him. Even after a customer has disclosed, that has closed his account and ceased to be a customer of the bank, the bank should not divulge any information about its former customer. He is no longer a customer, but you can't divulge his information. Uh, yeah, but it, uh, there are exceptions to these rules. I'll tell you them wherever necessary. But generally, the secrecy obligation you have towards any of your customers is 
equally they are in respect of a person who sees to be a customer. Now, I may be having an account with one of your banks. So you are, need, you are required by law to protect my secrecy. Right? I may close down my account today. Day after, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, you can't tell everyone, okay, this man was there earlier, now he doesn't have an account, therefore I'm giving you his account details and so on. You cannot disclose my account details and my information because even though I cease to be a customer, um, secrecy obligations on the part of the bank remain to be the same. There's no difference at all of a bank, uh, of a customer of an existing customer and a former customer. A contract between the bank and its customers is governed by the law of the place where the account is kept in the absence of express agreement in contrary to the contrary. What it means is that normally yeah, there should be a particular law governing your account. The, there are laws, you know, laws of Sri Lanka, it can be laws of England, it can be laws of uh, New York or something like that, uh, state law, yeah, or it can be European Union law. There can be different laws applicable. How does one determine the particular law applicable to someone's account? I may be having an account in a branch, bank branch in Colombo as well as uh, an account in London. Uh, do the both these banks are governed by the same law because I am the common person, same person who is having two accounts, or else? Uh, since these places, banks are in two different places, would I be governed? Would that would my account be governed by the laws of the respective place where my bank accounts are kept? Uh, again, one might argue, I'm not really ready to answer that kind of a question. How, you, in the present context, how do you determine where the place of the account is even? I mean. How can you determine the place of the account when it comes to certain types of transactions? Without going into all those details, I'll tell you simply that generally the account is governed by the law of the place where it is kept. Right? Meaning, now uh, I have an account, say, with one of Sri Lanka's banks, say Sampad Bank. Sampad Bank is in Sri Lanka. My account is in Sri Lanka. I'm governed by Sri Lanka. My account is governed by Sri Lankan law. Not because I'm a Sri Lankan, but because my account is kept in the place where the governing law is Sri Lankan law. Similarly, uh, I might be having an account with uh, uh, Charminis Bank, which is HSBC, uh, which is not uh, fully a Sri Lankan entity. It's only a subsidiary, it's only a branch of an international bank. Now I'm having an account with say uh, HSBC Colombo branch. What does it mean? Am I governed by uh, uh, Sri Lankan law or uh, laws of England, English law? My That particular account is governed by Sri Lankan law. Reason being, bank may have its origin somewhere else which is, which is the head office may be governed by a certain other law, but the place where my account is kept is the branch here. So my account should be governed by Sri Lankan law. That is the situation there. To, to demonstrate this position, I'll take this uh, particular incident. Uh, Libyan Arab Foreign Bank versus Bankers Trust Company. Uh, which is a 1989 case uh, where a Libyan bank, the Libyan bank in London, demanded money line in its accounts in the London branch of the defendant US bank. No, it's like this. Now, Libyan Arab foreign bank was in London. Uh, I had an account in London branch. And sorry, the Libyan bank in London demanded money line in its account in the London branch of the Libyan. Yeah, it's like this. Uh, BT as Bankers Trust is a US bank. They had a branch in London in the UK. Now, Libyan bank had an account 
with the London branch of Bankers Trust, which is a US bank. Uh, by that time, there were some presidential orders issued by, uh, I think it was uh, George Bush the Senior, George W. Bush's father, against uh, some Libyan assets. They have freezed, frozen Libyan assets within US. Now the question was, what are frozen Libyan assets within US? What is the bank in which this Libyan entity has money? Bankers Trust Company. Bankers Trust is an American bank. So American President's order would be applicable to all American banks. That is the ordinary position. Now, on that basis, Bankers Trust London branch say, no, sorry, we can't give you money because our president doesn't want you to withdraw money. He has frozen all your accounts. But it was argued before English courts and the decision was that the balance in the London branch was governed by the English law and the defendant bank was bound to honor the demand and the presidential order whose uh, presidential order in the US was not binding on the London branch. Right? You see, Bankers Trust was a US bank, which is ordinarily bound by the orders issued by the US president. But this particular freeze in order could not have an effect on accounts kept in the London branch of the US bank, Bankers Trust, because the law is that accounts in a bank are governed by the law of the place where they are held. Now the place where the accounts were held was not within US but within the UK. For that reason court held that bank should give that money back to Libyan entity because American president's orders cannot apply in the UK. right? So, interpretation is that uh, these are governed, bank accounts are governed by the place where the account is kept. Right? Uh, I'm reminding you, whenever you want to ask a question, you can ask. Right? Please go ahead whenever you want to ask. Uh, then next question, the next part is that commencement of the relationship. Uh, normally, bank customer relationship starts uh, as soon as the bank accepts the mandate and the first deposit. Right, the moment to accept someone as a customer, open an account. That relationship starts. Uh, I don't want to go into this section eighty two description. Uh, it's related to uh, bills of exchange, so I'll skip this second part of the slide. Uh, the moment he starts, opens an account, bank is under obligation to discharge his legal duties towards his customer. You should treat him as a customer. You can't uh, forget about his security, but the secrecy or the, right? That's it. Uh, then I'll go into general principles governing bank customer relationship. Anything on uh, the initial part I covered? Um, yeah, before I go into slides and explain those lengthy cases, I would uh, tell you something very general about bank to customer relationship. That is, uh, bank to customer relationship is predominantly generally a uh, uh, debtor creditor relationship uh, bank a customer relationship is a debtor creditor relationship even before that i would call it a contractual relationship bank a customer relationship is a contractual relationship if you look at uh, different relationships that we have in our day to day life they can be i mean certain things are 
contractual one in the, that is the one we are dealing with now debtor uh, bank customer it's a contract you need to work according to contract but if, when it comes to certain other relationships <coughs> say your relationship your parent is not contractual you are not uh, working with your parents in terms of a particular contract uh, then uh, when you work with uh, say you are a partner of a partnership your relationship to the partnership it's different you are the trustee of a particular trust it's a fiduciary relationship it's not contractual right uh, certain things are moral certain things are very kind of driven by natural affection and things like that but there are certain relationships which are contractual generally contract the commercial relationships are supposed to be and presumed to be contractual right it, it, the, uh, for example now if you are uh, selling uh, say uh, your vehicle to someone essentially it goes without saying that it's a contractual relationship it's a contract between parties but there may be certain circumstances you are doing the same thing uh, with the family member probably there are again uh, it's a question of evidence question of facts it may or may not be a commercial contract for example uh, it's a contract but it may not be a commercial contract. But when it comes to commercial things, it, the presumption is that they are always uh, uh, entered into with the intention of uh, creating a binding relationship, which is contractual. Now, the general principle governing bank customer relationship is such that uh, this is a contractual relationship. You are supposed to work within the parameters of the contract. Uh, that, that, that's a requirement. So while you go on like that, there can be certain areas where you may be uh, probably violating the terms of the contract. Those violations may like to give rise to the termination of the contract. Right? There can be certain circumstances where you become entitled to receive damages, where you become, uh, where you may be compared to pay damages. All these things can be there in a contract relationship. Now, I'll go into details using these uh, details. Oh, uh, sorry, before that, I didn't explain you why did I call you call it a, a debtor creditor relationship. Now, generally, how we look at the bank customer relationship in the legal context is that bank customer relationship is a debtor creditor relationship between the bank and the customer. How? Is it because bankers are giving money to customers and banks are creditors and customers are debtor? No, that is the lending part. This this definition this comes in because of the uh, deposit part. So the de definition is that bank customer relationship is a contractual relationship, predominantly a contractual relationship, which basically has the characteristics of a debtor creditor relationship where bank is the debtor and customer is the creditor why do we call a customer a creditor the customer is the person who is giving money now when you are running the bank the customer comes to you and gives his money to you bank accepts that money bank is the debtor bank Customer nai him ya. Customer is giving his money to you. So customer is the nai him ya, creditor. And you are the banker is the debtor. Now customer might make a demand. He tell you he comes to your bank and tells you that I need my money back. What is he doing? He's recovering his loan. Now on that premise. In the bank customer relationship, this nature of the relationship is supposed to be a contractual relationship, and it is described as a relationship akin to or similar to the relationship between a 
data and a creditor. Where the bank is the data and customer is the creditor. Customer is the creditor. The powerful party in that sense is the customer because he is the creditor. He is the one who gives money to the bank. Right? You see that the focus here is on uh, the deposit part, not on the lending part. This is deposit part. A customer comes and deposits his money. In other words, customer comes and lends his money. Bank is accepting that money by as a loan. Bank is indebted. Bank has to pay that, right? So the bank customer relationship is basically a contractual relationship, which is having regard to its nature can be explained as a uh, uh, data credit relationship but mind you they, this is not the only explanation that you can give to a bank a customer relationship now uh, while the when the customer comes and deposits his money and bank accepts that money you can call it a, a data credit relationship but it's not the only relationship You'll, from your understanding you know that there are different relationships a customer might come and obtain a loan from the bank then the data is the customer and bank is the creditor. Uh, customer might come to the bank and obtain a loan mortgage in his house or something. Then it can be described as that particular security part. Uh, the customer is the mortgage O and bank is the mortgagee. It likewise, customer may be uh, bringing some uh, valuable material uh, say some jewelry and he is, can pawn that money pawner and pony relationship sometimes in theory we sometimes refer to certain things as bailer bailey relationship now that is you customer comes and keep money it's not a stock of money it's, the, it's not a particular bundle of money for the bank to keep in safe custody and give, give back to him but money is fungible in ordinary sense. When money is given to the customer, the bank, a bank can use that money with their money and other people's money and do whatever they want. <laughs> when the customer makes a demand, what the bank has to do is to give him an equivalent amount of money. The bank is not giving that customer's money. I mean, it's not identical set of currency notes and coins that the bank is giving back. Money is fungible. There is no difference between customers' money, this customer's money, and that customer's money, and bank's own money. The all these things commingle and go into certain investments and loans and lot of things. And the customer, when he makes a demand to withdraw money, can be made out of paid out of any money. It goes into a pool of money. There, are the customer is defined in the uh, uh, on the case as a uh, creditor who gives a loan to the bank, which is a later. But there can be a situation where customer keeps money for some other valuables uh, with the bank, not by way of a deposit, but in some other manner. Here I want someone's response. What is that particular way? How does the customer keep some valuables in the bank? Probably other than money. Can a customer keep his valuables with the bank? You all know that. Any 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 instrument, any service that you offer? In pawning. Yeah, pawning. Yes, that particular item has to be returned. Yes, that's one thing. There are the relationship is pawner and pony. Yeah, that is there. Uh, rather than there, there is a loan as well, right? You pawn the article and get, take money. Uh, but safe lockers. Safe lockers is the yeah, exact example. Now there may be safety lockers offered by a bank. So someone becomes a customer of the bank and uh, to have a safety locker. Now the safety locker is a place where a customer can keep whatever things he is legally permitted to keep. It can be uh, jewelry, it can be diamonds, it can be even money. Now, the money kept in the safety locker is not going into a common pool and it cannot be commingled with other people's money. 
that has to be kept intact in the safety locker and wherever customer wants subject rules uh, <coughs> can take that money back that, now in that location you will see that the money kept in an account and money kept in the safety locker are not serving the same purpose uh, and therefore they cannot be categorized <coughs> into a same a particular category the category is different <coughs> earlier it was data credit relationship where the customer was credit and bank was data here if you are keeping some a particular asset with the bank and bought that itself then it's called uh, bailer bailey relationship bailer b-a-i-l-o-r bailer meaning that you keep money keep goods and thus those goods need to be returned right bank cannot <coughs> use them telling that uh, that is also going into a common pool and it's getting commingled and things like that that's not possible now you'll see that bank a customer relationship broadly it's a contractual relationship predominantly a data credit relationship but there can be several other definitions uh, of this relationship but before going into slides and explain case law and things like that governing this concept i mean something else just came to my mind that is again about the law governing this relationship now i'm going to tell you specifically this uh, predominant relationship that is bank customer relationship is a contractual relationship uh, of a debtor and creditor debtor and creditor right contractual relationship akin to a relationship between a debtor and creditor if it is a contract of debtor and creditor uh, what should be the law how should be the things are governed I could ask Menaka, Menaka, how do we normally give an interval? No, I think I didn't. Uh, 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 so it can, uh, I mean, uh, normally after two hours time, uh, we right. can give a... Uh, okay, now the, I mean, the, right Menaka, thank you. I, I thought of giving some, uh, in, uh, in between, so since the session was from 8.30 to 12.30, 10.30 is the midpoint, now it's 10.22, Shall we take a break of something like, uh, say, 1040? Uh, so we were at uh, general principles governing bank customer relationship where I told you basically that uh, contract, the bank customer relationship is a contractual relationship. And I explained this contractual relationship as a debtor creditor relationship and also told you that uh, it's possible that it can be differently viewed or uh, interpreted differently as well but predominantly uh, generally a banker customer relationship is a contract which can be described as something similar to debtor creditor relationship so uh, having told that uh, there are uh, other aspects of uh, this which can be uh, very easily explained having a resort to this particular case this is Burnett versus Westminster Bank Limited uh, which was decided in the UK in 1966 now in this case this is something parallel to your check uh, uh, clearing system in Sri Lanka uh, basically not not check imaging and truncation CIT system but check, check clearing system which was introduced I think in 1980s you know that how check clearing works uh, you get this uh, what is that letter in is called MICR yeah MICR lettering that that kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, different special print on check leaves uh, which is a collection of information about your account number and so on now this system was uh, operative in Sri Lanka from 1980s but uh, check, check clearing system uh, automated clearing systems came into operation in the UK in 1960s. This is the thing that came into 
this this particular issue arose uh, during that period. The facts are that the this person called Bernard had two accounts at Westminster Bank at different branches. Now, for you to uh, under, identify it simply, I would say that just imagine that uh, one of your banks. I'll take someone not present here. Say uh, it's Elan Bank uh, has two different branches. One, it's uh, say. Uh, head of his branch and uh, fourth branch there is a person having two accounts at two branches of this bank right uh, when this micr check leaves uh, checks were issued to customers one particular branch went into micr system first it was a kind of phased out operation so one system went uh, one one particular branch went first and other system other branch was supposed to Go later. Uh, now, up to that point of time, any customer of the bank who is having an account with any branch of the bank would have used the same checkbook to draw checks on any account. Now, if someone has an account with the head of his branch as well as the fourth branch, the same checkbook would have been used for both branches because there's no difference nothing technical checks are supposed to be for any branch of the bank but at this moment since this uh, uh, micr characters were supposed to recognize bank branches and only one branch is in my uh, clearing system and the other one is not what they did was they told the customers there was a particular instruction on the check cover book or cover of the checkbook uh not to use those checks to operate on other accounts at other branches say we just imagine that head of his branch goes into automated system other branch is not now branches both branches issue checkbooks to customers uh in uh, they instruct customers not to use these account and the checkbooks for any other branches because now results may be confusing there may be some problems but this customer, you know, you all know how customers behave. They would do anything that you would ask them not to do. And also, they won't do anything that you ask them to do. That is the behavior of the customer. Still, you consider the customer as the king or whatever. And go on. This, one, this particular customer, Bernard, had used such check leave to draw checks on another account. Say he is having, the, having accounts with four tassel as uh, uh, head of his. Now he uses for checkbook to uh, draw uh, checks on the head of his branch, vice versa, or vice versa. Even now, I mean, basically he is drawing checks using the checkbook issued by some other branch. Now, what would happen uh, when check clearing process is going on? Clearing system would identify it as a check drawn on that particular check leaf the on the account that below that is connected to that particular check leaf so if you are drawing a check on a checkbook issued by fourth branch even though you are addressing it to head of his branch if you are drawing it on head of his branch even if that is your intention it is not how it it is recognized in the clearance system clearance system recognized according to the micr lettering now, when MICR lettering is, uh, the, the system recognizes that there can be problems. The required amount of money may not be there. Or else, uh, in this particular case, later this customer wanted to stop payment on that check and inform it to the branch. <coughs> so he, his intention was that he was drawing a check on a particular branch. So he informed that branch mistakenly or, or intentionally he has used the check leaf of issued by the other branch to draw this check even though he gave information to the branch that was in his mind in fact clearing system directed that check to the other branch so there is no reason why the other branch should stop the payment they paid the amount out of that account then now 
Bernard's argument was no. I gave you stop payment uh, instruction. No matter what the branch is, that is your business. I don't care. I asked you not to pay. This is the contractual relationship. You see, contractually we are bound. I, according to contract, I gave you instructions not to pay, but you paid. So bank, you are in violation. You are you are in breach of contract. That was his argument. He argued that banker customer relationship once established can only be varied by express agreement which implies knowledge and consent of the customer. That is correct. Customer's mandate to his bank is normally a check, but it need not to be so. That again is a very valid argument, very bright argument. Normally a customer issues his mandate by way of a check to pay, but it's not necessary who said that it should only be a check. He says, <clears throat> he can use any paper and even write in pencil as long as the mandate is clear and unambiguous. Now, we think that a check can be drawn only on a particular check leaf printed by the bank. That is the case, I mean, unless it is going to be a, a real chaos. But now he argues that it is a contractual relationship. I only have to give instructions. The way I have given instructions may be one of the check leaves that you have printed for me. But again, even I can uh, write it in a piece of paper with a pencil. If so long as my instructions are clear and unamb unambiguous, you need to honor. That was his argument. Now, he says the MICR lettering was put at the foot of the check for the banks and not for the customer's convenience. But it's, I, I, I'm not concerned about that. Ba it's bank's business. So if the bank has done something wrongfully, that's not my fault. The caution of the check co book cover, remember I told you that the cover carried a caution saying that uh, uh, customers should not mix up their checkbooks. They should draw checks using that particular checkbook only for the account they are maintaining at that particular branch. Now about that, Bernard has an argument. What he says is that that particular caution on the cover book, checkbook cover, <laughs> is only is not binding on him on him that could have been binding if the customer expressly agreed to it otherwise it's not a proper notice can someone remember i think there are two three lawyers i understand uh, uh, there's this case uh, i can't remember the exact name someone versus uh, marlboro corporation Can someone remind? Um, there's something uh, I can't remember the first name. There's a particular name of a particular lady. Now, in this case, it's an interesting point. I mean, it's something similar to this one. The uh, I don't know whether I have referred to it here somewhere. Or not. Uh, in this case. Uh, not in this Bernard Tulsa's Minister case, only Oliver's Marlboro. Oliver's Marlboro uh, case, what happened was there was a, a couple, a husband and wife, they went to a particular hotel to stay there. And at the counter, they were, they basically gave their information and they were given the key. Then they came to the room and opened the room with the key. And we, inside the room, Remember, inside the room, there was a notice saying that the hotel is not res responsible for anything lost or stolen, right? The hotel was not responsible for anything lost or stolen. So this husband and wife stayed at the hotel. Uh, and uh, after some, uh, maybe after two, three days or so, they, when they were about to check out, they observed that this lady's necklace was not there. It was missing. So they told the hotel, look here, we were at your place. Uh, it was your responsibility to look after our valuables. So you need to be responsible. Hotel said, no, sorry. We are, yeah, we know that we are, there's a responsibility, but we have excluded that responsibility. There was a notice in the room saying that the hotel is not responsible for anything lost or stolen. So we cannot bear responsibility 
We cannot take responsibility because we have given the prior notice. Okay. Now this matter went to courts. Uh, the, the argument was that whether the uh, hotel can claim so. The, on the other hand, uh, Oli's party, Oli, that lady argued, uh, uh, true that you gave notice, but look at the point at which you gave notice. It was after I entered into the contract at the reception, I got the key, then I went to the room, inside the room, there was this notice. By that time, I have already entered into the agreement. That agreement does not contain any clause to waive your responsibility. So the subsequent inclusion of a condition by way of a notice inside the room cannot bind myself because I didn't consent to that. That's your unilateral notice of which uh, by which I cannot be bound. So she argued that that is not binding on her. The court basically argue, uh, accepted that argument and said that, look here, contract is already entered into at the reception. So this is a subsequent notice. Do you see some kind of similarity with this case? Now, the banker-customer relationship we told, now we discussed earlier, it starts at the point someone becoming a customer. Now, he became a customer, that is a contract. Now, what Bernard says is, after that contract was entered into and when everything was going fine, you put up a unilateral notice on the cover of the checkbook to say that I can't use my checks uh, on other branches, which is not binding on me. That was his argument, right? We'll see the bank's argument. Right. They argued that uh, uh, bank issued the checkbooks and customers agreed to draw their uh, mandates, that is, checks are using only them. And if the customer uses check issued to him, the only detail he can fill in are the date, the name of the payee and the amount. He cannot vary the account to which check is directed to the uh, uh, branch of the bank. Right? Yes. But the bank says is we give you option. We give you the opportunity to vary certain things. What are those things? Date, name of the payee and amount. You cannot use our checkbook and check leaves and uh, use them to draw checks on certain other accounts of other branches. Right? Any variation will be disregarded because the account is contained in the uh, MICR lettering at the foot and the computer will only read the MICR letters and act accordingly. Whatever you write, whatever your intention was, the bank will go on by the MICR lettering. So the bank's argument is that they are not going to be responsible for your own fault. Uh, and they, uh, this is the decision. Uh, unless otherwise agreed, a customer's written order to the bank need not to be on any particular form. That argument, do you remember? I can write on any paper using even a pencil. That was upheld. Unless otherwise agreed, that mandate can be anything. The problem is normally when we enter into a bank customer relationship, now we agree on that. Right? Uh, the bank could not unilaterally restrict the customer's rights. That is correct. This is contractual, you cannot unilaterally restrict. A restriction being possible only by agreement between the parties. Both parties need to agree. The bank's contention that the two sentences on the cover of the new checkbook constituted a variation or restriction of the customer's right to projects was not acceptable because it was not an adequate notice. Now what the court has said is, whatever the bank has put on the cover, no, cover page of the check is not binding on the customer. You see the reason? Checkbook covers had never previously been used for the purpose of containing contractual terms and they fell within the class of documents which customers could reasonably assume contain no conditions varying the contractual arrangements between them and the bank. Checkbook cover is not something that you expect bank to give notices. So they, that can be disregarded. That was it. Uh, and the uh, 
the notice on the cover did not bind the customer to the new restricted use of the checks for only one account. Yeah. If the checks form itself and not merely the checkbook cover both the words limiting its use to the particular branch and account shown in print upon it and would it that would be adequate notice to the customer and he would be bound by that restriction. Court goes into make a subtle distinction between having a notice on the cover of the checkbook and having the notice on the check leaf itself. What the court says is if the notice was on the, in, was on the check leaf itself that would have been a proper contractual term uh, notice to the customer uh, but something printed on the check leaf sorry cover book the check book cover is not so so going by this what would have been the decision court held that customers instructions uh, customer not uh, obeying the instructions of the bank even on the cover of the checkbook is correct but the bank uh, refusing to accept that stop payment order was wrong now from your point of view being practical bankers what do you think this is a is this a progressive decision or otherwise I mean, this, is this a good decision or not? Anyone? Hello? Can someone tell me now this is the decision? If you get come across this kind of a decision, what do you think that what would happen to your life in banks? This is going to be a very difficult situation. Now you give a customer, not this to a customer, he says, No, I am not accepted. And now you are intended, uh, things are not binding on me, and things like that. Now, but you see that you send a lot of notices now. Even I think if I can see my not messages today, I have got certain messages from certain banks. They uh, inform you about changes of certain rates and so on, and and different things. Now are all these things invalid? You need to make sure that these things are valid. Now I'll go to this slide. You see the first point here. Unless otherwise agreed, the customer's written order to the bank need not to be on any particular form. So the way out is that you get your bank to agree, you know, the customer to agree. If you agree at the point of the mandate of the, I mean, someone joining the bank as a customer, then you can do that. You can tell them that, look here, uh, we can communicate you using letters, registered port, faxes, telephone messages, uh, email, everything. Then the customer can't later turn on, come and say, that uh, I don't know what emails are. I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't act, agree to uh, receive phone calls. So you need to get all these things done um, at the point of someone becoming the customer, not later. That is the lesson that we learn from a practical point of view. And then I go into this uh, case to explain that now this Bernard case shows how this relationship is contractual. You see that uh, concept that was applied by the uh, British court was exactly the, the principle enunciated in um, Oliver's Marlborough Corporation, that hotel incident. If you have lost the, your valuables in the hotel room, if the notice was there only after the contract was entered into, you are not bound by that. Now, the same argument has been applied in Bernard case. What it means is, how do we connect them? Mar Oliver's Marlborough is a celebrated case in uh, company, uh, sorry, contract law. Same law of contracts has been applied in Bernard versus Westminster. This shows that bank customer relationship is a contractual relationship and contractual terms are binding your relationship. Now, I'm going to explain this particular contract being a debtor creditor kind of a contract how it works this is a very old case uh, 180 years old but uh, it's a classic case 
how it is explained the bank is the debtor and customer is the creditor it says a uh, customer brought an action against his bank for money is received he argued that the relationship between him and the bank was a fiduciary nature similar to that of a principal and agent and that he was entitled to know what had happened to his money and what profit had been derived from it a bank is in a position of a trustee for those who employ him you see his argument is that i gave you money then there is a relationship that relationship is in a one hand uh, on one hand is a principal agent relationship i as a principal ask you bank the agent to handle my money so i need to know what happened to my money i gave you 100 rupees what happened to 100 rupees how much of that you kept in the central bank as reserve statutory reserves how much out of that 100 rupees you spent uh, used uh, in your lending portfolio how much of that 100 rupees you used to build your head office how much of that 100 rupees you used to uh, uh, pay salaries of your bank employees and likewise probably he might want to know whether his 100 rupees entirely went into bank, uh, uh, employee salaries or something like that he wanted to the bank to give an account as to what happened to his money right and also he said that now the argument is that i am the principal and you are the bank i am the customer principal and you are the bank sorry agent the cust the bank and also he said that this is a fiduciary relationship uh, the bank is in the position of trustee for the benefit of me i am the beneficiary and you bank is the uh, uh, other uh, trustee you must look after my property my money as a trustee you must account for the money that i have kept with you you see this real argument what he says is i gave you money you need to look after that money and tell me what happened to my money right is this a, a ordinary position how we would expect right uh lord cottenham uh uh lord cottenham uh, was uh, the judge who who uh, very vividly explained the position he said that the relationship of bank and his customer is that of a debtor and creditor that's the first principle here right as i mentioned earlier this is a debtor creditor relationship money when paid into bank ceases so to be the, together to be the money of the customer the customer once he gives money into the hands of the bank is he ceases to be the owner of that money that money becomes money of the bank it's not any longer customer's money it's bank's money this is a very important principle keep that in mind the, it is then the bank's money he is known he in the sense bank is known to deal with it as deal with it as his own he makes what profit of it he can which profit he retains to himself he can make any profit out of that money and retain it to himself he is not guilty for breach of trust in employing it and he is not answerable to any customer if he puts it into jeopardy a salary can can anathurata damma thore kiyanno one bank because this money is no longer customer's money now it's banker's money banker can deal with it whichever the way he wants so he can use that money in any way he is not answerable he can put that money into jeopardy there is no breach of trust there is no trust between bank and the customer uh so bank can even misuse that money that's what the argument says he is not bound to that's what judgment says he is not bound to keep it or deal with it as the property of the customer but he is answerable this is the important part for the amount because he has contracted having received that money to 
repay to the customer when demanded a sum equal to that paid into this money. Hands. You remember? Please read the last point carefully. What it says is he is not bound to keep it, keep that money or deal with it, considering it is customer's money. But he has a responsibility to pay that amount because he entered into an agreement, he contracted to repay the customer when demanded a sum equivalent to that paid into his hands. You gave me 100 rupees, so I'll give you 100 rupees back. Probably interest can be done. Yeah, together with interest. That's only a contractual obligation, but there is no fiduciary relationship, fiduciary responsibility for the bank to look after money as if this is um, handling someone else's money. I need to be very careful. That kind of stories are not there. Bank can do whatever they want. Only obligation is to pay an equivalent amount of money. It's bank is not using, bank is not paying the customer, customer's money. Now, after the period or at the demand, custom bank is going to pay out of its money an equivalent amount as paid into the bank by the customer, right? What do you think of this uh, argument? This judgment, what he says is, bank can put your money into your credit that's okay only issue is that at the time of the uh, uh, say customer coming in and asking for money you need to give an equal, um, equal amount that's it someone can give the ideas about this judgment I think best person to comment on this is Tilanga. Can we allow a bank to say this? Tilanga, are you there? Look at this argument. What the judge says is, this is contractual. You bank gets money and is obliged to pay back. As it is contractual for him to pay. But other than that, bank can put that money into jeopardy. Is this the current situation? Now, that's why I told you at the very beginning. I'll take the case law, I'll take the common law position, I'll tell you the legal position as far as the common law situation is concerned as well as the present regime, maybe for practical reasons or certain other statutory reasons. Now, statutory laws all over the world has significantly changed this position, but the concept still remains the same. It is customers, customer's money is going given to the banker's hands become bankers money it's not it's not customers money but there are a lot of laws everywhere in the world that ensure that money paid into the banks of the customer need to be treated very carefully looked at very carefully and if there's something going wrong you know, something that puts customers money into jeopardy probably bankers must be should be held responsible bankers need to be personally held responsible uh, there are a lot of laws that can put bankers into jail and severe punishments are there for bankers misusing customers money. So don't tell anyone that central bank's direct legal said the bank is not guilty for breach of trust in employing it and bank is not answerable to its customer and even if it puts jeopardy that is a judgment yes 
but there are a lot of laws that override this kind of a statement. Now, you know, why I asked Tilanga from Central Bank to explain is that Central Bank imposes a lot of regulations. We say that, look here, you can't, uh, I'll take a simple one regulation to ex uh, uh, kind of uh, demonstrate this. Now, customers pay a lot of money into the banks by way of deposits. Then banks can, banks are of course supposed to be financial intermediaries, they collect deposits and give loans. In giving loans, a bank might consider that, look here, I can give loans. So I'm not guilty even if I put my, this money into jeopardy. This is now my money, bank's money. So I'll, uh, they would call that chairman and chairman's wife, chairman's uh, brother-in-law, chairman's uh, that the oldies are getting huge loans and then their CEO CEO thinks that this is uh, now bank's money, you know, why, why should I be worried about customer, he will get a kind of a significant uh, approval for a significant loan for his family members and things like that. This can happen, but central bank has lots of very strict regulations, single borrower limits are there, uh, related party transactions are prohibited. Uh, I mean, in related party transactions, there are specific requirements as to how board approval should be obtained and one, what kind of securities should be kept. All these kind of strictures are there. Why? To protect customers' money. Now, this concept, this particular position expressed in the 18th, uh, 19th century cannot be the law in any country by now. This can be the law if you put money into some illegal deposit taking entity somewhere in Anuradhapur also. But no regulated entity can argue on these lines today. Not that this law is wrong, not that this particular judgment is wrong, it's right. But this is not the position when you compare the, compare the, uh, the judgment with the statutory laws prevailing in the country. Now, there are a lot of laws included in the Banking Act, which basically overturns this principle given in Holly versus Hill. So it's a folly to Hill think that we bankers are safe because we can put money, in, put customers money into jeopardy. Now it's the other way around. Bankers cannot do that. Bankers should protect customers' money, right? I'm not sure whether you are getting my points and whether you are agreeing with or whether you can. Even when the mic is not working, I get that message from the from manager. Mm -hmm. Um. Shall I uh, leave some time for you to ask questions? So, would you like to ask questions while I go on? Uh, if you ask questions, I know normally, as everyone says, uh, your the, I mean, absence of questions can be defined in two ways. Either you understand or you don't understand at all. If it is the first case, I'm very happy. If it is the second one, I don't know how to deal with that unless you ask questions. Um, again, uh, the fundamental relationship between, yeah, sorry. Hello. Someone wanted to ask something or accidentally got the mic on. Right. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a separate one where our Lord Atkin said, uh, bank undertake to receive money and to collect bills for his customer's account. The proceeds so received are not to be held in trust for the customer, but bank borrows the proceeds and undertake to repay them. You see, what it says is, bank is not keeping the money in trust for the customer. This is not trusted relationship. But banks borrow proceeds and undertake to repay them. Only a credit debtor credit relationship, which is a contract. It's not a trust. The promise to repay is to repay at the branch of the bank where the account is kept and during the banking hours. Now, this kind of thing, you know, uh, 
this judgment is again correct. But you know that this is not the case in practical banking, where the account is kept. No, you can withdraw it from any branch of the bank. Now, if with uh, with uh, uh, let's say, what is it, uh, Lanka Pay? You can withdraw it from even from ATM machine of some other bank. If you are abroad, you can withdraw it in some other currency from other ATM machine of a foreign currency, foreign country as well. All these things are possible. But this uh, express you see that in 1921, conceptually they are there, but with some other contractual arrangements, overriding contractual arrangements, we have agreed that you can withdraw it from other banks as well, ATMs of other banks. You can withdraw in other countries as well, subject to certain limitations. Now, all these things are there. It also includes promise to repay any part of the amount due against the written order of the customer addressed to the bank at the branch. That is again, uh, that similar thing like checks and so on. Customers' duties to the bank. Right? Do customers have duties to the bank? Now, before that, I would like to tell you something else as well about this uh, bank customer relationship and the, especially about the debt credit relationship. Right? That's why I stopped uh, before the break. One thing I told you was uh, that this is a debt credit relationship and and I was about to ask in the data credit relationship how is the relationship is maintained and how it is get settled finally. Now the opening is the relationship. There is a way that relationship comes to an end. It's like marriage and divorce, right? Uh, there can be certain instances you open up it, but naturally uh, until it comes to a natural end, it goes on. But this is a contractual relationship. Bank, the debtor creditor, it's a commercial relationship. In that kind of relationship, as much as there is an entry point, there should be an exit point as well. Or else there is a way that the relationship is managed. Now, uh, if this is termed, or if this is described as a debtor creditor relationship, the customer is entitled to a particular sum of money from the bank. Bank owes some money to the customer. That is the nature of the ongoing relationship. Now, if there is an operational requirement for the customer either to end that relationship or to make some money, a part payment of the loan, that is a withdrawal of the bank, how should it how should that happen? Then if it is a loan, debtor credit relationship, who should start that settlement, repayment? Uh, in other words, what I'm asking is whether the debtor should seek the creditor and ask for give his money, or the creditor should seek the debtor and demand for his money. I think that I'm not making it very complicated since you all are uh, uh, senior bankers. My, my question is, the debtor, should the debtor go to the creditor and tell him, look here, thank you very much, this is your money, I'm giving you, my, giving you the money I borrow. Or should the creditor go to the debtor and ask for his money, I gave you money, I need back, right? What should be the concept? I'll, I'll number them. De debtor should go to the creditor and return his money very courteous way. I, I borrowed money. This is the money I'm now, I have come to return it. Or the other way out. Creditor goes to the return. Sadhya Dalak, you know, I gave you money. Why don't you repay it? Repay it now. Now, that is the second approach. What is the correct approach in law? One or two? I need an answer uh, for so this that question. Way. Hello? Yeah. 
uh i think so the it depends on the agreement uh, in between them uh, that uh, uh, d- uh, normally a uh, debtor has a uh, period of repay a uh, repair to repayment and uh, if the he or she fail to do the um, do that repayment within that period agreed period so then the creditor has a uh, uh, rights to go back to the debtor and to ask for the money uh i think it, so it's depend with the contract they have each other yeah that's a very good answer if there is a contract like that as to how that debt should be settled that should happen according to that perfect uh we will assume that now we are talking about a particular situation bank a customer relationship here again there are certain things like you know that customer can come to the should come to the bank and withdraw money that condition is there so one can say that that is what it goes it, it's correct it goes along with uh, your answer uh, that since the since the contractually customer is bound to come to the bank and ask for money customer should come i mean if there is no agreement what would happen it if i mean if there is no agreement in this there is a loan agreement customer has given money to the bank that's there but as to resettlement repayment there is no agreement as such uh, what would have been the method i mean under normal uh, we'll forget about banks under normal debtor credit relationship what would have been the way data should uh, and if the contract is silent on silent as to how it is settled data should go to the creditor or creditor should go to the data one or two data should pay to the creditor data should go to the creditor and yeah settle the thing that's one answer is it right oh, others can the creditor can always ask the data for the repayment back and then see if the data would honor his wishes okay so creditor should go to the data mm-hmm. can go to the data at least oh, yeah i think um, you, this is the reason why you should not be uh, ashamed or afraid to answer my questions very often whatever the answer that you give to my questions is correct it's going to be correct i can rest assured that no one is going to give wrong answers to my questions because now i got two different views both are correct both are correct and, uh, for different reasons one is that if there's first answer was about a contractual arrangement prior to settlement that is perfectly correct in addition uh, uh, there is one other thing i'll ask you this what is the law governing bank customer relationship in sri lanka oh, i'm asking i know that you don't have particular law background i'm asking whether it is roman dutch law or english law you know sri lanka's general common law is ordinarily roman dutch law what is a bank uh, law governing bank in sri lanka any answer english law hmm? sorry thank you english law it's english law it's english law because of, uh, i mentioned i think uh, in view of the civil law ordinance uh, which was which introduced in this law into sri lanka um in 1799 if i'm not mistaken english law is the law governing bank customer relationship generally uh debtor credit relationship is a contractual relationship it is governed by uh uh roman dutch law in sri lanka in sri lanka's contract law is roman dutch law now we are going running into a very difficult situation uh i told you that both your answers are correct because english law recognizes that in a contract uh debtor should come to the creditor and settle his dues that's the first answer right that's correct english law says that then roman dutch law says creditor should go to the debtor and ask for his money 
creditor should go to the debtor and ask for his money. It's a Roman national concept. Now, we said that English law is the law governing bank customer relationship in Sri Lanka. If the bank customer relationship is a debtor credit relationship, and English law is the law governing that, then debtor should go to the creditor and settle the dues. If that is the case, whenever customer deposits money into the bank, bank will have to ask the customer and give his money back. Look here, sir, you gave us some money. This is it, we are returning it. It's not happening that way. Whenever uh, the customer wants, customer will go to the bank and ask for money. That is the agreement. Now, how does it happen? Even in, in is it because that we are applying Roman Dutch law? Because Roman Dutch law is that creditor should go to the data and ask for money. Customer being the creditor, go to the bank and ask for money. Is it that? Is it Roman Dutch law governing bank or customer relationship here? No. Here, it's a very uh, nice situation where Roman Dutch law position is equal. Sorry, on the, I'll put it in a different way. English law general principle is that data should go to the creditor, but English law recognizes an exception. When it comes to bank customer relationship, creditor must go to the data. So English law's general principle is one thing. When it comes to bank in law, English law says creditor should go to the data. Roman Dutch law also says creditor should go to the data. Now, in Sri Lanka, English law's exception applies, which is similar to Roman Dutch law's general policy, which is creditor must go to the data and ask for money. In addition to that, so creditor must go to the debtor, customer should go to the bank. In addition, that is how contracts are also drafted. For that reason, in Sri Lanka, as elsewhere, debtor, sorry, creditor, that is customer, should go to the bank and ask for his money. Right? I think I'm not overcomplicating the thing, but you need to have some idea that these things are happening not because it's happening in that way for some hundred years or something like that. There's a legal explanation to all these things in Sri Lanka. Even though we are bound by English uh, Roman Dutch law in ordinary data credit relationship, bank customer relationship is a special thing that is governed by English law. In English law, ordinary principle is that I should go to the creditor. But English law recognizes an exception in the case of banking transactions, creditor must go to the data. In those circumstances, um, now customer goes to the bank and withdraws his money. This is the same thing happening. Means to sell again, but there are recovery officers come to the customer, right? Loan can be paid. So the same thing happens. Creditor goes to the data. Creditor goes to the data. That's how uh, data credit relationship is in operation in Sri Lanka, right? Any questions on that point? Now I have developed a, a small habit after the break we had around 10.30. I would be asking you whether you have questions. Not because I expect, expect you to ask questions. It's good if you ask. But uh, I'll give you some time asking, allowing you to ask questions. I know if not questions are not forthcoming, I have some small snack here. Okay, when it comes to the duties of a customer, generally English law recognizes that there are two main duties on the part of the <coughs> customer towards the bank. These two duties are called the Macmillan's duty and the Greenwood duty because of two, research, two cases that considered these certain aspects of bank customer relationship. Mm. Look at the first one. Macmillan's duty is the duty to exercise due reasonable care 
in Rowan checks so that the bank is not misled that for and forgery is not facilitated. You customer need to exercise reasonable care when he draws a check. Why? Otherwise, bank uh, may like to be misled and there is a possibility of frauds happening. Customer has a responsibility to kind of avoid that kind of situation by being specific, by drawing checks in a very clear manner. Uh, agreement to agree is some sort of a, a extension to that, which says that there is a duty to notify, notify the bank immediately if the if there is some check forgery with in relation to a check right excuse uh, me sir okay. yes uh, the slide is not changing i think we are not uh, viewing the same slide that you are reading out sir is it changing now not yet Are you changing now, sir? Um, now you must now, be on. Yes, we are now on the correct slide, sir. Right. Now you can see it, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Macmillan's duty, I explained it, it that customers should exercise reasonable care when he draws a check so that uh, the bank is not misled and the forgery, forgery is not facilitated. The Greenwood uh, duty is that uh, you need to be uh, you need to inform the bank whenever you becomes aware of a forgery concerning one of the checks you have signed right now these two things have been described in uh, uh, because those two names are because of uh, two famous cases uh, one is this london joint stock bank limited versus macmillan and arthur in this case a clerk prepared the check for two pounds, two sterling pounds, uh, payable to bearer. There was no sum in words then written on the check, but after it had been signed by the employer, the clerk altered the figure to 120 sterling pounds and inserted the words 120 pounds in the space provided. The court or uh, that bank was entitled to debit the customers. You got the point. There was a person, uh, there was an entity which maintained an account with the um, London Joint Stock Bank. This entity had a particular clerk who prepared a check for two pounds. Then he got it signed by the whoever the employer the the real signatory of the entity uh, when the check was signed it just indicated the amount in figures um, two two pounds uh, but it was not given in words right right after they got the check signed after this person got the check signed by the employer he changed the amount of the check to 120 sterling pounds and put it into his account or oh, somehow he basically did some sort of a forgery he got the money for his benefit or something like that that now the that is that that was done by the clerk now the real customer the company argued against the bank saying that look here you can't debit me 120 pounds because I had the intention of drawing a check for two pounds now this is wrong you have paid 120 pounds so you must be responsible was the argument of the customer bank's position you know, been, uh, that no you will need to be careful maybe you or your clerk or whoever if you have signed a check where the uh, where the amount is not written in words you take the risk this person may have ordered but you need to sign a check properly prepared 
so that forgery is not facilitated, bank is not misled. So on that basis, uh, the, uh, argument, the the concept came into operation. The customer need to be careful, right? Don't fill the judgment. A check is drawn by a customer is on is in point of law a mandate to the bank to pay the amount according to the tenor of the check. It is beyond dispute that the customer is bound to exercise reasonable care in drawing the check to prevent the bank from being misled. Customer need to draw the check properly. If he draws a check in a manner which facilitates fraud, he is guilty of a breach of a duty as between himself and the bank, and he will be reasonable and he will be responsible to the banker for any loss sustained by the banker as a natural and direct consequence of the breach of the duty. You see that here, customer has been real negligent. He has signed the check without verifying whether the check is properly drawn. So the court held that, look here, customer cannot act like that. Customer need to be careful. There is a duty on the part of the customer to be careful, right? Uh, you got the point. What if, uh, now in this case, uh, do you see some, this, this uh, particular clerk, he has done a forgery, a truth, he has basically cheated his employer, done something wrong and employer was in difficulty. Still, I would see some sort of a good, uh, I don't know what happened. He put, he changed 120, sorry, two pounds into 120, right? If he wanted to put a three digit number, easily he could have made, I mean, space was available only on either side of the number. He could have made it 929, put in two nines, on either side of two. But what he did was he put one and zero on either side of two, making it 120. Whenever I go through this case, what I realize is that this person has put the least possible number. Uh, I mean, even if though he has done something fraudulent, he has put such a small number. I mean, instead of one, you can't put zero before two because it is meaningless. So he put the least number that is one. And then in the other space, that's uh, units line, he put zero, the least possible number. And probably, he wanted to have the least amount of suspicion or probably the amount available in the bank account was not very great. For some reason, he did it in a very shrewd way, but the customer was held responsible. Or this Kulatilaka uh, versus Merchant Bank of Mercantile Bank of India is a Sri Lankan matter case. There again, uh, something similar happened. Again, uh, so similar thing. Uh, uh, Supreme Court exonerated the paying bank from liability for accepting and paying the forged checks and held that he, it was entitled to debit the customer's account with the full amount. Okay. Customer may have been, uh, customer may have allowed his employees and so on to uh, do things, but uh, that is not bank's fault, but customer need to be careful. You see this uh, second point. It was in evidence that customer was not able to write out write in English and amounts and any other particulars on the check. He all he could do was to sign it. Lanka Amnesty Law could sign it. Anapulam on that. The last one, that's not enough for a card. But this person could not even write letters or figures, but he was able to sign. So he signed. 
judgment is that no, it's not the way. You cannot be negligent. If you are working with the bank uh, as a customer, you need to be careful. If you have done something negligently, if the clerk has changed and whatever happened, you need to be careful, responsible to the bank. And the other one, um, second duty, which says customer need to inform the banker any fraud happening in relation to a check drawn by him. Uh, you can see the facts here. I think you have gone through it, uh, but it shows is that the um, plaintiff the, 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 and his wife had a joint account with this defendant bank, which is Martin's bank. Um, later, earlier they had a joint account. Later, they closed down the bank, uh, joint account and opened an account only in the name of the customer, husband. But uh, the checkbook issued by the bank was in the custody of the wife. Whenever husband wants to draw a check for some matter, the wife used to give him a check leave, not the checkbook. Husband very obediently, wherever he wanted, drew checks using the check leaves provided by the wife. Uh, later he found that uh, his wife has also forged his signature and using his checkbook to draw checks. Uh, then he found that, uh, when he found that, he inquired about this from his wife. Uh, her explanation was that uh, she was doing so to help her sister in some litigation matter and uh, begged him not to inform the bank about this forgery that she has done. She, she uh, as basically fraudulently this husband's signature. So this husband agreed. Uh, lay, now he didn't inform the bank. Later again husband found that the wife was doing the same thing and she is drawing checks again and again and then he found that uh, what she told him earlier was not true that she was not helping her sister in a litigation but she was doing something else. Uh, he was furious and he now said, uh, I'm going to inform this to the bank of his wife who was not very serious about uh, husband's signature and husband's earlier warning that she should not do that. He was very upset when the husband said that she, he would inform this to the bank. So she committed suicide. And uh, now this husband, the customer, uh, is left with nothing. He lost his, um, his money in the account, he lost his wife and everything. Now he thought of recovering the money at least. So he sued the bank, alleging that the bank has credited his account wrongfully without his authority. The reason being the checks were not really signed by him. Checks were signed by his wife, forging his signature. So he wanted the bank to return the money drawn by his wife using his signature. Uh, bank, uh, uh, the, the customer, that is, the husband argued that the wife has not very skillfully forged his signature. If you had reasonably checked the signature of the wife with the forged signature, the bank would have identified that it was a forgery. And uh, apparently, these checks wouldn't have been uh, cleared if the bank's officials were careful. So the customer argued that you are responsible. You need to pay me my money. Uh, the bank argued that when the husband came to know about wife's forgeries first time, about eight months earlier than this incident, Husband kept quiet. He remained silent. He did not complain to the bank. He agreed with his wife not to do this kind of things again and again, and uh, that was it. Now he says, by doing so, the husband committed a breach of duty to disclose forgeries, and he is stopped, meaning that he cannot now claim that the that there was a forgery and he should be entitled to money because. Having known this forgery eight months ago, 
he did not want to stop that by informing the bank and uh, getting the money recovered. Now the bank argued, uh, no, you have known this forgery, but you didn't inform us. So we are not going to give you money. The decision is that by the customer's failure to fulfill his duty, the bank was prevented from bringing an action against the plaintiff and his wife. If the customer uh, uh, brought an action, uh, informed this, bank would have sued them and recovered money. Now it was prevented. Therefore, plaintiff cannot now uh, argue that signatures on the checks were uh, forged and therefore uh, he was not able to recover his money. Now, the you see the logic here is that uh, even if there was a forgery, if there is a forgery, the account holder has to inform that. If he keep quiet, not informing the position, later he can't come and say that uh, there was a forgery and I need my money back. That's not facilitated by a court of law. Right? Uh, there is one other case in this one. Uh, this is also very I think connected to those two. Here, what happens is uh, it starts it. Uh, no facts are given here. Artifacts are not given. Yeah, in this case. Uh, if I can remember correct, uh, the facts are like this. Now, in this tying cotton mills limited, uh, there was a person who has kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, forged the company, companies tying cotton mills limited, which maintained an account with uh, Liu Chongqing Bank of Hong Kong. Uh, there was an employee working in Thai in cotton mills who forged certain checks over a period of time, right? So the bank uh, did not know that they, this person was forging the checks, but by thinking that these are genuine transactions, bank also honored uh, those payments. After some time, management of the company came to know that there has been forgeries over a period of time. So they went to, they, they claim that bank should be responsible. One of their employees has been doing this repeatedly and uh, bank has not been uh, careful to notice these things. Then the, therefore company argued that uh, the bank should pay back all those monies uh, basically defrauded by the customer. Bank's argument was, no, we have been sending you accounts uh, statements or from the very beginning. Now, if there has been any kind of uh, uh, responsibility, if uh, any kind of a perusal by you, the customer, that is a company, of those statements sent by us, you should have noticed that these transactions are going on. Now, having kept quiet for a long period of time, now you can't say, uh, you can't tell us that uh, your money has been defrauded. You would have said that uh, uh, I mean, you can't keep quiet when the statements are there, but now you can you, you come and complain. This is not acceptable. Then, what is the position of the tying companies? How they complied with the uh, Greenwood principle? Greenwood principle is that when you come across a fraudulent situation, you need to inform the bank immediately. Right? They have done that. When they saw that, when they identified that there were certain forgeries, they identified the bank, informed the bank. Now the bank says, no, we kept on sending your statements. You should have noticed it earlier. You should have read the bank statements then you uh, would have understood that there was a forgery going on. There is a duty for you to check your bank statements periodically, which you have not done. Now don't complain. 
because you have not done your part. So we are uh, not in a position to give you money. That was the bank's argument. The petitioner, the plaintiff, Tying Cotton Mills Limited, successfully argued that no, you are wrong. Why? There are only two duties for a customer of a bank. What are those duties? Uh, to pay, sorry, to, to be careful in drawing checks so that bank is not misled and forgery is not facilitated, which is uh, Macmillan's duty. And also to keep the bank informed wherever there is a forgery going on in relation to uh, the account as soon as they come to know about forgery. Now, company argued that there was a risk requirement under Greenwood duty, we informed you. Other than Macmillan's duty and Greenwood duty, there is no additional duty, there is no third duty on the part of the customer. So bank cannot argue that they send the statements and therefore um, they can wash their hands over this incident uh, because just say that we didn't read the statements. Uh, court, argue, court, court basically agreed with that argument and held that tying cotton mills is entitled to recover their money against the Liu Hong Chi, Bank because there is no duty on the part of the customers of the bank to uh, uh, read the bank statements. So, uh, bank was success, not successful, was successful. Now, do Excuse you... me, sir? Yes. Uh, sir, slides are not moving. I'm not doing anything. I don't know what is going on. Uh, uh, yeah, that's perfect. Right. The slide show not started. Slideshow. Right, I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. Now it's okay. Is it? Slides are coming now. Yes, sir. We are in the uh, high income main. That one. Right, right. Uh, so, a general position is that bank uh, customer is not bound by uh, any uh, duty other than those two Macmillan's and Green. But in addition, we sometimes identify certain other things like uh, to seek out the bank if he requires payment, right? That is the thing I earlier told you that, uh, you see, they have, I have said that it's a other way out of normal rule that data must seek the customer, here the creditor must seek the data. Uh, to issue checks only if his account has sufficient balance to honor the check or unutilized overdraft amount. Right now, this is a general requirement that you know that customer should not draw, not should not draw a check, knowing that he his account has uh, doesn't have sufficient balance. It might amount to an offence as well. Under what? You all must be knowing this. If a customer draws a check without sufficient money in his account, it can be an offence under. Something that right? is that correct? Section 25 of the uh, DR Act, Debt Recovery Act, says that it is an offense. Uh, one might commit a crime, commit, a, commit an offense if they draw a check not having knowing that they don't have money in the uh, account. Right. So this is the second, second bullet point here. No, I said there are only two duties, no additional duties, but practically these things come up, right? You know, because of the recovery act, this second part is there in Sri Lanka especially. Uh, to pay charges as agreed. Now these things agree at the point of someone becoming a customer. Now, basically customers agree at the point of entering into the contract to do these things. So are uh, that general position uh, Martin, the, sorry, Macmillan's duty and Greenwood duty would come in ordinarily. Common law position is that these are the only two duties. But to pay charges and the, this thing and, and to draw checks, there are certain other legal and procedural requirements. Now, when it comes to certain other things like, say, clearing house, rule, clearing house rules and so on, there may be further requirements. Now, these things are not uh, sometimes um, directly 
uh, written into the bank customer relationship contract. But there are certain things presumed, and all these things are basically forming uh, the the operational environment. Now, um, I remember now in this first case, what is the Macmillan's duty? I told you that two pounds was written in uh, number, but not in words. That is why the clerk was in a position to change it to 120. Uh, what if the number was also written in letters? The change would have been diff difficult. Now, uh, what happens if there are two num two things in the sense, say, customer uh, originally drew it for two pounds, but later for 120 pounds. If he has written that two in letters as well, uh, and Clark changes it to 120. Now there are two messages in the same check leave. In words, it's a two pounds, right? In, in, in figures, in numbers, it gives 120. What would be the applicable thing? What is given in words or what is given in uh, figures? In this case, a uh, check has to be written sir, uh, to get the confirmation. Why? Yes. Why? Yes, I agree. The check would need to be written because there's a discrepancy between the amount in words and figures. There's a discrepancy. So you can't, where there's a discrepancy, you don't get the clear message. Bank doesn't know whether to pay two or 120 right uh, that is the reason why and and uh, the operational requirement i think you are referring to is that uh, clearing house has a, a requirement in clearing house rules that where there is a discrepancy like that one in figures and one in numbers uh, uh, the words are different you need to return the check right to get further instructions that is the position um what does the bills of exchange ordinance say Bills of exchange ordinances, if there are two uh, things, one in figures and one in numbers, uh, you need to pay, go by what is in words. What is in words? So in this example, what is in numbers was two, what is in words is 120. So what you should pay according to the uh, bills of exchange ordinance is 120 but you are going to say that uh, look here our clearinghouse tool says uh, it's uh, not clear and therefore it should be returned right uh, i might come up with the third argument uh, now how then the argument is with those two arguments now you said that uh, that should be returned because the instruction is not clear that is perfectly correct uh, you see the uh, provision in the bills of exchange ordinance, which says that what is what should be paid is the is what is in words. That is a very good argument because now numbers, figures can be changed easily, but words cannot be changed easily in a checkbook. That is why the law says you need to go by what is in words, not not what is in uh, figures, right? Uh, uh, and I would come up with the third argument. I think I think more prudent position would be that it's not not in the bills of exchange ordinance or clearing house rules. I would argue that the bank should pay whichever the small amount. Two and hundred and twenty. Two. You can pay two, not hundred and twenty. So your uh, exposure, your risk is limited, right? There is no rule to that effect. <laughs> this is my uh, own thinking. There can be different arguments in all these things, but the practice in Sri Lanka is that we go by the 
uh, the clearing house rule which says that there is an ambiguity so you should not pay right where well, there is a uh, discrepancy this is what should be the treatment so uh, uh, the we return the check now how can clearing house rule prevail over what is in the statute law enacted by the parliament now, sometimes banking practices also has some sort of value one day if your check is returned because of this reason you might consider filing an action against the bank saying that you cannot i mean clearing house rules cannot override the statute provisions in the abyss of exchange ordinance but it's very unlikely that argument would sustain for a number of reasons that uh, bankers practice is also a very strong point of law even though hierarchically uh, statute provision should prevail over other things and also i'm sure that when bank customer relationship is framed there should be in your agreement somewhere in the customer some kind of implied kind of a knowledge at least to the effect that where there is a discrepancy what is what the result would be the check would be refused now that reminds me uh, something i heard sometime before a uh, kind of anecdote uh, which says that uh, one day uh, when the bank was about to close for its operations towards evening uh, bank manager got a call from somebody uh, apparently uh, um, from a lady uh, and uh, according to this bank manager those are the sweetest words he has ever heard now this lady wanted to uh, very in a very kind of a musical tone she said that she wanted to get a check in cash uh, whether she can come to the bank the bank manager said that we are about to close still uh, i would uh, stay please come because he he couldn't resist this uh, very beautiful words of this particular customer and uh, he asked one of his assistants to stay with him to make this payment uh then a uh, bank in as knows who stayed uh, furiously thinking what is wrong with our boss this man wanted to stay for some month uh, kela i think banana banana avdu then uh, apparently about uh, half an hour after that this particular lady turned up the bank adapted turned up at the bank and manager also uh, told uh, in between the the assistant uh, look here now i want to stay because there are those are the sweetest words i have ever heard so i can't resist staying so i will stay and uh, make this payment so this lady turned up then uh, the manager realized that uh, this is the ugliest person he has ever seen he has immediately shouted at this customer woman and said uh, no 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 we are not going to pay anyone after the bank in hours why should you do you come here don't come to bank like that this is not your place and now we okay la come tomorrow come tomorrow okay la all them then the you know who is furious bank in assistant who was asked to stay for some particular customer now he said the uh, boss what is this you wanted me to stay saying that there is a customer coming and after she turned up you chased her away what is going on then the bank uh, bank manager said you know in bank in practice when figures don't match the words we reject that we reject the payment right that's what happened there um, with that i think uh, we can conclude today i didn't cover up all the slides but uh, we'll cover up them later on mm, today i'm stopping some about 20 minutes earlier uh, this is the first time i'm doing a kind of a long presentation i mean a, a kind of a teaching kind of a thing after several years so it's bit tired but we can go on from next week onwards we will stop here since we are about to start the kind of a major part here we'll do it uh, next week and go on like that thank you you can raise any questions i can stay any amount of time uh, till 12:30 of course uh, if you have questions otherwise we can wind up any questions
Martin. Okay, we'll stop here and start at 30 next week.